Um, we'll call the select board meeting of Monday, July 9th, 2018 to order at 6.32 p.m. Um, we'll start with announcements, agenda review, and opening remarks. I'll start with the fact that Mr. Wald will not be joining us this evening. He is uh, not available. Um, are there any announcements or agenda items that my colleagues want to mention regarding the um, things on tonight's list? I believe we have uh, a person here for, for an application. Um, so we may take that up a little bit earlier than we would normally um, relative to uh, licensing uh, for uh, sale of uh, wines at the uh, farmer's market. So we may take that up first since that person is here, I believe, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So wait for a second. Is there anyone else here for public comment other than items on the agenda? I'm guessing that the other folks are here for that. All right. Um, is there any other agenda items or anything that anyone needs to mention? Okay. So given that, we don't have anyone here for other public agenda things. We will start under section seven of our agenda, which is licenses, public way, and metered parking reservations. And we'll start with the application by a farmer winery to sell at the farmer's market. And so I believe we have materials in our packet relative to that. So hang on a second. We'll get our materials pulled out. To the right place here. And so, if you'd be so kind as to introduce yourself. Good uh, evening. I'm Lori from Lori Perkins from um, Home Fruit Wine in Orange. Okay. And we were approached this year by Mr. Hamilton to work at the um, setup at the Amos Farmers Market. It's been quite a process in getting here. <laughs> hmm. um, so I thank you for hearing me tonight. Great. And um, we can go from there. If you have so questions. why don't you tell us a little bit about your business and, and a little bit more about um, uh, your uh, working with our farmer's market and tell us a little bit about what your expectations are of that. And then we may have some questions for you about some other things. And so why don't you sort of paint the picture. This gives you an opportunity to tell the viewing audience, not that there's that many, but a few of them, just about <laughs> what you have and, and when you'll be uh, assuming approval of the license and all of that, when you'd be available and, and a little bit about your uh, products. Okay, so um, we started uh, making wine in 2014. We got our bonded federal license then. Um, we opened our retail store in Orange. We turned our garage into um, a retail store to sell our product. And we make um, fruit wine. Some of the fruit we get right from our own orchard on our property. We have raspberries, blueberries, rhubarb, um, and we make only fruit wine, so it's just the fermented fruit. It's not a great blend of anything. So it's the true full flavor of the fruits. Um, and what we don't produce in our own orchard, we buy from local farmers um, in our area and friends and family. And um, we've opened our retail store in 2015, so we've been in business for three years now. Uh, we are currently in 10 retail stores, and um, right now we currently at our store we have a farmer's winery license, which only allows us to do tastings. We're hoping to go to the town and get our pouring license in the near future to expand. Um, that's our goal, but we thought we would try the farmer's market and see how it went. Um, I can only commit to every other week because we do have other commitments. So this year, our, our season will probably be cut a little short, but our biggest selling season is the fall. So we're hoping we'll do pretty good and we want to get our products out here to the area here. Um, we do have it at Atkins Farm here in Amherst. Um, that's the only one I have in the area here. Right. Okay, <clears throat> great. Thank you for that. Do my colleagues have questions? Mr. Simon. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ms. Perkins. Hi. Um, so I had a couple questions. Now, the only, as I understand what you just said, and I repeat it back for confirmation, um, that 
your direct sales where you are yourself the seller of your product as opposed to having other stores sell it is limited to what you're doing at your um, farm store in Orange. Correct. We produce it there and then we have a store there. Um, I've obtained my transportation license and my salesman permit to be able to go out into the package stores and farmers to sell the products. Um, those are included in the packet that you have. Okay. So, so we don't have a distributor. We don't use a distributor. I'm the distributor myself. So you're the, uh, this, this would be the second location at which you are the seller yourself as opposed to having. Yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the procedures you use to make sure that um, you're not selling to any underage um, uh, purchasers? We require a legal ID and, uh, for anyone over 21. Have you um, gone through any course from um, either police or ABCC or private enterprise uh, regarding the, pro the procedures for um, appropriately carding and enforcing that law? Well, we are regulated by the ABCC. Um, that's on them to regulate people. We weren't required as a farmer's winery to go to that licensing part. I believe once we go for the pouring permit, then we would be required to take that. Um, like a serving or bartender's type, but we'll only be serving our own wine. So that's another avenue that um, we would have to look. But the state law is you can only serve one ounce servings, and you can only give free samples, and you can only allow one one ounce free serving. And will you be doing that at the farmer's market? If it's allowed by, by the town. Um, Ms. Brewer. No, go ahead, Ms. Brewer. So, so I'm starting to get really confused here. <laughs> um, I totally understand that you have a separate place at your winery where you sell um, alcohol. I would, even though you're doing that there, it's obviously not just on ABCC to determine if you're selling to underage drinkers. Oh, I know that's on us. Right. Yeah. I, it's, it's obviously on you. I know that's not what was really intended to be said. But what I'm trying to understand is, and I got nervous when I heard the concept of pouring license. Are you referring to a pouring license here or a oh, pouring no. license there? No, in orange. Right, so that you can do more. Right, that's like, our expectation like a brewery to expand. Would, et cetera. Yes. I understand. And so here, you're saying that you're limited at the farmer's market to one, one ounce free serving per customer. Over 21, correct. Per day, basically, because I'm, I'm finding that a little surprising based on our previous experience with um, discussion at what's happening at the farmer's market, but perhaps they're doing less than one ounce tastes. I'm a little, but that's not your problem. <laughs> that's our discussion problem because um, there was more than one taste being provided by the previous or current winery that was existing at the farmer's market to customers that were there. So if that is, in fact, the rule, that definitely makes it clearer that there wouldn't possibly be any over-serving if there's only well, under, one under this, serving Excuse me, under this state law, you are allowed up to five separate one-ounce tastings, mm -hmm. and you can charge for them. But when I looked into the laws of the farmer's market, they, it's, I interpret it as one one ounce serving per customer. May, may I ask a separate sure, question? Please. So, and, and to confirm, I believe you'd already indicated this, but to, again, to be sure I'm clear, you will be the person, you, you said you could only really do, your company could really only do every other week because of other commitments, but you yourself will be the person yes. as opposed to someone else you've trained yes, or I'm relative. I'm the one that holds the license. No, it will be you yes. automatically. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions? Do you wanna follow up with? I guess my only follow-up is just an observation, and I've shared with you, but it's not going to necessarily affect my vote. 
uh, when we get to the a motion being offered. Um, licenses um, can be counterfeited, can be difficult to follow, particularly if you're um, confronted with out-of-state licenses that then you're not as familiar with as Massachusetts licenses. And um, since uh, you've said nothing and I didn't have an expectation that you would use the kind of electronic checking systems that restaurants that sell larger amounts of alcohol have, um, that um, familiarity with, when, and this is implicit in what I was asking a moment ago, uh, familiarity with um, both how Massachusetts licenses should be scrutinized to make sure that they're authentic and um, what to look for if you're going to accept out-of-state licenses, which is always a separate question, are very important questions. So I just wanted to, you know, those are concerns that I always have because um, in a college town, we become very vigilant on this subject. That's something I had never actually thought of because there is such a variety of um, out-of-state licenses probably in this area that is something I wasn't aware of. I am familiar with a lot of different states because I actually work at Valley Medical Group here in Amherst, and we now have to ask people for their licenses, so I see a lot of different licenses. <laughs> um, I'm beginning to familiarize where the dates are and all that with that. So, But it is, that is an area that I, I will be honest, I hadn't really thought about that. So I, I, I think I will be more aware of that and check into that if there is rules to do that or... Um, if someone knows, please inform me. I don't know if there's anyone in the police department mm -hmm. that uh, Ms. Perkins could uh, consult with just so that she's more comfortable. Sure. We could connect someone with you from the, our police department. Okay, yeah, that would be great. We deal with that a lot, yeah. I have nothing further. Ms. Kruger? Um, I wanted to make the motion, and then I had a comment, so I, I could do it after we have the motion. Sure. Um, I move to approve the application for a special farmer winery license for home fruit wine farmer winery to sell alcohol at the Amherst Farmers Market for the duration of the outdoor market, which would be um, these, uh, uh, from the present time to November 17, 2018. Um, I'll second that. I'll second. Okay, you had an additional comment or? Um, Question. So I'm just looking at this, and what are, usually with these requests, we have the owner or manager's name, which we do not have on this. So if I could amend it to say um, Laurie Perkins, owner manager, or something like that, just to be to be consistent. Um, I think it's signed that way. It, it's just my motion didn't have it, so just to be consistent with what we enter into the minutes for our motion. So my comment. Did I have a second? I... Yes. Okay. Sorry, not, so my comment is just, um, I really appreciate that we're doing the same kind of due diligence we do for a new liquor license for a package store asking similar questions, because I think that's only fair. But I would say, on balance, the risk of alcohol abuse from the one ounce serving per person for a fruit and wine at the farmer's market is probably in the very far side of the spectrum. So with that, I feel very confident that um, the risk factors are, are, are pretty negligible for, um, you know, I'm not saying it would never happen, but uh, some of the ID and age appropriate um, things that we usually ask about, I, I think this is just the very low risk category of wine district, wine use. I would agree with that. I also think though that, that uh, if, if we just wanna make you aware of, of, of what environment you're entering into because uh, as we found in other places, uh, if if a more relaxed attitude is taken around IDEs and that sort of thing, those of the younger variety tend to find those uh, oh, yes. <laughs> places and seek them out. So you you, you might run into a, a circumstance you didn't intend to or, or anticipate. So we're just trying to make you aware as much as we want to be diligent that. in our work. But um, is there further comment or suggestion? Yes, Ms. Brewer. 
since there is in fact another winery that's currently set up to be at the farmers market one of the things I would like to just ask that somebody somehow some part of the process clarify is around the one ounce issue and around the charging issue because I don't know that it would have made a difference but I am saying that previously when we we've approved a couple of years in a row the existing uh, Mount Warner vineyards there and we worked under the assumption that they were going to be very small samples I don't think we specified what size but that they were going to be free samples not you know selling a beverage of that size which is really pouring um, at that point so um, if Mr. Bachman has more information on that then. yeah I talked to the farmers market manager on Saturday and he said that those people retired and that's why he was eager to have a new mm -hmm. new uh, winery come into the market there this will be the only winery in the market so that answers one question in yep. terms of consistency between the two of them. Um, competition has never been our concern, but uh, <laughs> consistency is, is our concern. And so, therefore, I am, I am questioning whether or not we would feel the same way about this if we were sell if there was a sale of a sample, which is to me a different situation than a free sample. And if that's true, then I would like our motion to include that information. But if that's not true, then we just let it hang the way it is. I just don't remember this coming up before as being something that we had heard was a possibility of something to do. And if we have feelings about that, this would be the time to express those. It's new information as far as I'm concerned. Right. Ms. Krueger. Um, my feeling about it is maybe that's something we explore in more detail when we get to our alcohol policy document but um, I, again I think that with one I, my understanding that the samples is so people can select if they want to buy a, a bottle of the fruit wine or whatever it is that's the product and <coughs> uh, I don't feel well versed enough on the different state versus farmers market regs um, again pretty confident that this will be used in a responsible manner I would agree I would also suggest that perhaps what we should do is is the research on that to find out what those differences are what limitations we might or might not be able to place because that may change or we may want to be more specific with renewal mm -hmm. for next year but I think in the short term given the current explanation of what they're going to do I'm not too too worried about it. but I do agree that we should have clarity about what is or is not allowed under the license and if we're um, and whether or not that is more problematic for us moving ahead yes so if I could follow up then I don't have any confidence that we're going to have any time to work on alcohol policy prior to December 3rd therefore what I would like to suggest at this point is that we encourage the applicant as well as anyone else the Amherst farmers market might be working with that were they to continue doing this because it's been a great success this year um, next year that when they come before us again because it's my understanding this is an annual license still is that they provide not on us but that they provide the information as to what they are allowed legally to do and what they are choosing to do mm -hmm. those being the two pieces of information could I just comment on that sure um, when I researched this prior I was told it was up to the town and the town's alcohol regulations okay. so and that's as far as pouring permits too so which which as you may have gathered we may or may not have limitations we're just not immediately aware right. of. Right, and not, not everyone is aware of it, too. I mean, I, I try to do as much research as I can ahead of time. So Great. when I, had, I researched it last year, because I was thinking of doing it to, in Orange, right. and um, it was totally up to the town. Okay. So, so that's my point, is yeah. we don't have the regulation. Right. So that doesn't mean it. there's no regulation. So it's not entirely only up to the town what kind of samples can be provided by a farm winery license at a farmer's market. There are surely some rule associated with that. I'm trying not to look at any of the attorneys who are in the room right now who might answer that um, because they're not, that's not what they're here for. But there is surely a rule about this. And so while we might have additional rules about it, I don't believe the entire burden is on us. I believe 
next year when the renewal license comes up, it should be described what the farmer's market regulations are in Amherst, what the farmer's regulations are statewide, and what the current plan is. Because it may be that after doing it this year, there's a thought of doing it slightly differently next year, which would be totally acceptable, as long as we just understood what the parameters were. Right. So is there further discussion on the, on the motion that we have? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous with one member absent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And we'll look luck. for you at the market. Yes. Thank you so much and have a great evening. If I just a quick yes, please. You did change the date to be today rather than April twenty first, yes. even though that's the normal season. I right. said duration until November seventh. <laughs> okay. I fudged the beginning. Okay. Date. okay. All right. right. We did do that. All right. So we'll go back into our right. regular action discussion items, which is what we normally take up with first. And I'll start with our easement for seventy five East Pleasant Street, which I believe is a fairly straightforward item. Um, and there was a memo, I believe, in our, our materials from, from Mr. Mooring regarding this. I believe that requires our signature, but it also requires action. But Mr. Bachman, if you want to. Yeah, I just want to, in the, Mr. Mooring's uh, memo, it should reference Article 23 of the 2016 Annual Town Meeting, and that reference is, corrected, uh, is correct on the um, order of taking. Okay. Any questions relative to this item? There's no cost to us, I believe. There is a cost. Is a cost. Uh, if you look at Exhibit B, there's a damages award of $3,136.89. Okay, that is literally damages because when they were doing work in the area, they damaged the um, um, underground sprinkler system, and that was the cost of repairing it. Okay. So the, the easement wasn't a problem. It was the work. Right. Mm -hmm. Broke stuff. Right. Okay. So I would take a motion on this unless there are other questions. I'm happy yeah. to read this one. Uh, I move to accept the easement for 75 East Pleasant Street, Bank of America, parens at Triangle Street, and to execute an order of taking by eminent domain per Article 32 of nope. the- Nope, 23. It's 23 at the 216 annual yeah. town meeting. Yeah, you yeah. told me that, yes. But the mo 23, 2016. Mm -hmm. Yes, Article 23 of the 2016 annual town meeting, which authorized the taking of 1,671 square feet of property from Bank of America for the installation of sidewalks at the Triangle Street, East Pleasant Street intersection improvement project. Is there a second? Second. Yes. I'm fine with the motion saying this as long as our minutes reflect what was just stated previously in that there was no charge for the easement, there was no cost to the easement, because that's one of the things we always mm -hmm. talk about, was there a cost for the easement? There was no cost for an easement, but there was cost for damages, and that's why that's listed in case anybody goes looking for it. Right. Just as we said, it wasn't the cost of the easement, it was the cost of damages. We can say that's the sprinkler in our minutes, and then anybody trying to sort this out later can figure out that, nope, easement still didn't cost us money, even though some do, but this just had a separate issue. Yes. As I read it, I, it sounded f a little funny grammatically. I think it's either at the Triangle Street East Pleasant Street intersection or for the Triangle Street East Pleasant Street intersection improvement project. I think four would be better. Yes. Thank you. So if, if the seconder would accept that slight grammatical. Uh, yes. Huh? Okay. Any further comment? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And that's unanimous with one member absent. <clears throat> so next on our agenda, under marijuana update, although update may be not exactly the, <laughs> all of what's there. Uh, the first order of business we have there is a letter of support or non-opposition relative to the herbology uh, group. Um, and so we have a memo from Mr. Kravitz, I believe. And so, um, Mr. Kravitz first, or should we have them? I think we're going to talk first initially first. about the letter of support or non-opposition, mm -hmm. and then we're going to talk about the talk broader issue okay. of local license. Okay, yeah. great. So good evening. So if you'll introduce yourselves a little bit for us, and, <clears throat> and I know we've kind of done this all before, but we'll it again as it were uh, but if you want to uh, take us through 
uh, a little bit about your your place and your um, <clears throat> request. And but again, start with introductions of who each of you is, so that people at home know who who's who and why they're here. And if you take us through that, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, Frank Perullo, representing Herbology Group. Jane Hallman, CEO of Herbology Group. Uh, and hi, I'm Phil Silverman. I'm a lawyer with Vicente Cedarberg. We're a law firm, a national law firm specializing in cannabis that also represents Herbology Group. <clears throat> and if I may, just to start it off, I wanted to um, correct something that I had said previous time I was before this board uh, about the siting profile um, of Happy Valley. I had missed the name change to HVV and was unaware that they had uh, had a PCR and thought the siting profile, which expires in a year from being invited to siting. Um, so they do have a PCR. It is uh, current. Um, but again, we do have a signed purchase and sale agreement on the property. And the special permit, I think, is the, the local barrier for entry for, for other applicants. So the fact that you have a letter out on the property is, I don't think, a problem. Um, but having said that, and I apologize for that, um, I wanted to turn it over to Jane Hammond, CEO of Herbology Group. Hello, thank you for having me this evening. I sent in a letter to you and it had a revised floor plan. I'm going to read um, my letter and we can review that next. My name is Jane Hammond. I am the CEO and president of Herbology Group, Inc. Herbology is a women-owned, minority-owned, and veteran-owned nonprofit corporation that seeks to provide compassionate, high-quality cannabis to patients and consumers in, the wellness -inspired, in a wellness-inspired setting. <clears throat> Herbology has appreciated the opportunity to engage collaboratively with the town of Amherst throughout our efforts to operate a medical marijuana treatment center and marijuana retail establishment at 422 Amity Street in Amherst. Since we, have first, since we first secured our Amherst location in fall 2017, we have also moved forward quickly in Greenfield and East Hampton through the receipt of letters of non-opposition and, ex and execution of host community agreements. Following our presentation before the board of April 9th, on April 9th, we have revised and refined our plan to incorporate the feedback offered by the board members. And the concerns were a revised floor plan, I'm enclosed in the packet we see a revised floor plan. It has been altered to enhance the flow of patients and customers throughout the dispensary to ensure that patients enrolled in the medical use of marijuana program have an expedited confidential experience and to um, address previous loading concerns. There is a confidential patient consult area and the patients will receive secluded check-in and point of sale transactions evidenced in the floor plan. The next concern was our security. Above all else, Herbology prioritizes the en enhancing the safety and security of its patients, customers, staff, neighbors, and surrounding community. Herbology's security measures will exceed the requirements set forth by the state. Herbology has retained FTG Securities, one of the Commonwealth's leading security consultants to develop security policies, provide uh, engineering and logistics support, conduct and conduct system testing. Herbology is willing to submit our security manual to the Am Amherst Police Department for review and approval prior to an assurance of a special permit. And lastly, the medical, our medical product line. At the core of our values is the desire to help patients and customers that are suffering from chronic, often debilitating conditions through the use of quality cannabis products. We are committed to the pr production of medically focused product lines that provide high cannabinoid and low THC that then provide benefits to, of the plant without the associated euphoria. Um, these strains will be available in a variety of manners to ensure that patients are able to consume their medicine via a method that is most effective to their medical needs, such as balms, pills, um, salves, transdermal patches, oils, tinctures, and edible products. Sean Harrison of Herbology Cultivation Team has an extensive background in the development of um, non-euphoric, medically focused products for the medical marijuana industry. Prior to moving to Massachusetts, Massachusetts uh, Sean has, was a director of operations at Evo Labs, a national leader that creates pharmaceutical grade CO2 cannabis oil extracts. I myself also have uh, education in medical marijuana trade school in Michigan. Um, and a little bit about my background, I know we spoke before, but what rose my curiosity to start this kind of business was um, Originally, I was a, in the Air Force, and during that time, my daughter fell ill, and uh, she became a medical patient. 
I was uh, living in Colorado at the time. So she, you know, helped treat her illness and helped with her chronic pain, and I truly believe that this is a life-saving medicine. You know, it helped me personally. And on top of that, I also ran an alternative uh, healthcare practice as an acupuncturist in an alternative uh, facility that provided many different uh, treatment options, and many of the patients were seeking medical marijuana as a last resort or uh, option, you know, besides pain medic, traditional pain medicine, so. And we look forward to continue, continue working with Amherst. Trust the relationship. Thank you. So, Ms. Kruger. I have a question about the floor plan, um, and maybe more for um, staff than for you. Is this the size of the floor plan when you submitted it, or did this get reduced down? It, it's probably, I think it's reduced. It was a bi it was bigger, um, the printout. I mean, we can get you a well, bigger. Well, no, I just, so, and we've talked about this before. When we get larger plans, I know it's a real pain when you're doing the packet, but I can't read this. This is absolutely, you know where the new whether we could, you know, at some point in the future when we do these kinds of things, we could project it on the screen, but 11 by 17, I mean, I literally can't figure out where the medical. It's not much better. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe we need, consultation room this may be right. for us. Yeah. We may need a better standard. The planning department certainly does when applicants come in for subdivision permits or whatever, that, um, where we have some uh, uniformity of consistency of um, plan submission, just so if we're gonna look at them, it has to be uniform. I, I believe you that you've set segregated the medical yeah, from the right bit, there. but you can see what I, I, I don't I, I know. I, I'm having trouble myself. Yeah. Uh, and, and frankly, it's, I didn't wanna do the whole presentation. I wanted this to be a conversation between But that's okay, except us. that without, either backup yeah. visuals or you, you can't and just for any applicant you can't always assume we're getting the materials yeah. as in the form you submitted but do you approximately know the square footage of the medical section uh compared to the recreation just so i have a sense of what i am looking at maybe i can help with that um the it i don't know that you can say that one it's one or the other in other words the way the state has set this up what they want <clears throat> is to have uh, a, a general sales area where you can get information uh, about the medical aspects. What, they, what is essential to the state is that you have a checkout area that is dedicated to medical. They don't want medical patients having to deal with the recreational side. So that's the key here. There's really two keys. One is a separate patient consultation room, which they have so that a person can go in private and receive their consultation. And the other is that you have a separate dedicated point of sale station for just the medical, and those are the two things that they have here. That's the only, when you sort of say you split the that. square footage, the rest of the, the sales floor is actually dedicated to both. Um, so it's, it's not specifically sort of split up between the two. Yes, and we have the consultation room in three uh, POS stations, mm -hmm. and uh, there'll be a glass screen, a wall built, so they still have privacy mm -hmm. okay. within the area. I can follow. Again, that's not visually clear in any way, um, either from a rendering or from, um, I think, I'll just say for myself, and we've talked about this with other applicants and I think possibly as well as yourselves, um, to have um, the medical privacy, the, uh, you know, the state just says you can have a separate stanchion in a line. Mm -hmm. We don't feel like that's really the high, a high enough standard for serious medical use for all kinds of reasons. So it's something I'm gonna be looking at um, when we're getting these. So we, we need to have a way to see that or know it. Cause okay. In the rendering here we have, when you first walk in, you check in, and then there's two entrances. You can either, the patient still has privacy, they can enter the consultation room separate from the recreational room, mm -hmm. which we feels nice for the privacy. I, I think your point yeah. is actually well taken. I know yeah. from having, um, been before, uh, I think it's, is it the planning board that is the special permit? Uh, it could be either planning or ZBA, depends ZBA, what, can't remember, what but zone you're in. We will have to deal with that issue. So this may not be the exact uh, floor plan that actually goes before that authority that's going to ultimately is issue the special permit, but I think we need to obviously uh, deal with that issue that you're raising. Yeah. I just, <clears throat> please. from conversations I've had with, you know, friends, people, um, there's still some amount of where this might be medically beneficial. There's a sense of embarrassment or shame for using this product because of the social stigma that we've carried as a society. So 
Um, you know, maybe in 10 years it's not such an issue as you go to CVS and you can get all kinds of things and you're standing in the same line with everyone else, so people hear what you're asking for. I get that, but I think for introducing this as a, a new line that offers um, some unique benefits for certain patients, having that set of confidentiality and privacy is really important. Yes. Thank you. And I, I'll explain just, I know you can't see it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a consultation room and you just said the same line. We have separate lines, one for medical and one for recreational. And then there's a wall that separates that from the rec side and the medical side. And then, so they still have their privacy all the way up until the exit. And we feel that, you know, we could we at least trying to um, give these patients the privacy they need. So I'm going to ask a question, just speaking of the floor plan, and I'm starting to make out the extra small print. Um, <laughs> but but um, is, this, is this the existing building that you're using? As the, uh, because uh, you know, HVV had suggested a whole different sort of, they were going to knock down the existing and move it and rebuild it and that sort of thing. But your plan is to, to utilize the existing structure and remodel it essentially to accommodate your, your business and set it up. Is that correct? Yes. The questions from my colleagues at this point yes Ms. Brewer. so again using my wonderful reading glasses still not sorting out some of this print um, is that I'm seeing you come in the vestibule you turn right there's a consultation room then there's a waiting area for medical and a waiting area for recreational and there's nothing separating them except air um, right above it says glass wall mm. and we'll just extend that out so no ah the plan is to make that go further. It yes. obviously can't go all the way or you're not gonna be able to get into the recreational yes. oh, there, there section. There will be another door, so we're just separating that because they're still using the same exit. They might see each other on the exit. So. And we also feel a lot of the people in adult use could possibly there for medical reasons as well. So I guess that, uh, as I said uh, at our last meeting, that I had had reservations um, and ended up not voting for, but actually abstaining on the motion on Happy Valley after having voted for the other three that were granted in town. And a lot of the reason, or really, you know, 95% of the reason was because I'm not entirely comfortable with the idea of three businesses in a relatively short stretch in one um, road, um, which is what is, again, being proposed. And as I thought about that some more, I realized that um, as somebody who's representing the um, citizens of the town of Amherst who may have that concern, um, because I've heard stories about some sections in Colorado where there are tremendous concentrations relative to the size of the communities in some streets and how it has impacted the uh, neighborhoods and the appearance of the street and the, the uh, thought process about it. But it also uh, seemed that um, as a business owner, that you must have given some consideration to the question of proposing a location that's proximate to so much other competition. So I um, still am struggling with this question, and I didn't know if you had any um, thoughts or comments on the subject from your perspective, which is not the same as my perspective, but you must have thought about it too. Can I help you a little? Yeah, you can call yeah. Uh, The microphone. Oh, yeah. thank you. It's for the recording, not. Thank you. Uh, and we, uh, this is something we, we hear this question, and what we try to explain to people is this is not like uh, having a CVS here and a Rite Aid here uh, and another pharmacy, you know, all in conjunction that basically all sell the same products. That's not how this industry works for various reasons. Just about every dispensary, medical dispensary we have will, will cater to a slightly different crowd. They, especially the medical, have to grow their own um, and they have to process their own. And so they're going to process and grow different products. 
There are thousands of different strains of the plant, and then you can extract the cannabinoids. There are numerous uh, THC, CBD, and a whole host of others. And then you can recombine them, and they all have a different impact for different types of sicknesses. So I happen to know, for example, that Jane is a veteran and has a real sensitivity towards uh, you know, veterans and post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, what I can tell you is that you know, there are certain strains that you would not want to have somebody suffering from that be the one that you sell to them. So I suspect that she's going to have a product line that uh, caters to these particular patients. And they will, th there will be competition, but it's not everybody selling the exact same things. They will find different markets for the various patients in the community. Um, and that's why uh, you, in the medical before, Colorado is a little difficult to, to sort of study now because recreational has come in, but before that, you could see different dispensaries in the same area, but they actually all did just fine because they each carried products that were catering towards different people, uh, different types of patients suffering from different ailments. Yeah, to, to extend what you just said, and I appreciate um, your, um, what you've commented on about uh, medical marijuana and the different um, s strains and uh, different purposes. And of course, I understand that that's part of what the role of good medical marijuana establishment is, is to make sure that they're advising the patient to get to the right product and assisting the patient in that regard, which is what the counseling is all about. But uh, to the extent that the um, current state law and um, CCC regulations have essentially given um, a special status for medical marijuana establishments coming into the recreational sales end of the operation. It has the effect potentially of um, creating a concentration of recreational sales points um, all proximate to each other too, which um, also creates a um, appearance question because it's actually on a major gateway to the University of Massachusetts flagship campus also. And um, so there's a little bit of both that is in, in my concern. Sure. Uh I assume that's something that's going to sort of be fleshed out at the special permit stage when you get to the recreational side. There may, I think, theoretically be somebody that gets a medical license but is not allowed to necessarily uh, sell recreationally. That's one possibility. I, I don't know how it will play out, but I assume that's, that would be part of that process. My other question is entirely different. I just was trying, um, I'm very conscious of the fact that what exists in that property right now um, is a, a longstanding restaurant that um, has been uh, by somebody who's been in, owned by somebody who's been in business for a very long time. And, um, you know, they employ a lot of people. Um, and they have a good following, and I um, recognize that um, if all falls into place as you wish, at some point in time, um, that um, is the owner of the property, that you would have an arrangement to um, terminate their lease and essentially end that business. And I was um, just uh, curious as to how that's being approached and whether efforts will be made to allow them to stay in business and what they are as long as possible um, convenient to your own needs if you, they proceed as you wish. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And we actually already made uh, some arrangement. Their lease is either up or, again, not holding the lease. Uh, Happy Valley holds the lease. They were supposed to be out in May or June. We told them that as long as we are permitting and as long as we are uh, through this process, we would allow them to stay. So we extended their lease with, or we asked Happy Valley to extend their lease until November, which is when we would foreseeably be through any permitting process as we go through it. Having said that, we've been doing this for quite a while. It could be even longer. Uh, but, but having said that, we, we asked Happy Valley to do that. They asked for our permission. We said, sure, of course. That is something we've done, and okay. um, we're happy to. Uh, we'll be holding a job fair if we proceed. We would be holding a job fair on the site 
um, and, and hoping that we would actually receive some of the, um, the employees to, to stay with us, if they so wished. Um, at our last, I think it was our last meeting, and I think you were present, we talked about some of the qualitative aspects that we would be looking for um, before we signed host agreements, which is another sort of gatekeeping function. Um, and some of the ideas, and some of them are in the memo, have to do with prioritizing local uh, employment hires, um, the quality of the building, design, um, other uh, commitments to uh, contribute to the community. And um, as we go forward, um, I don't think we really have that set up for the issuance of, of the letters of non-support, uh, of support or non-opposition. But we're looking forward ahead to um, how we might use those kind of qualitative criteria. And I know you you listened to that conversation, so I'm wondering if you could share some of your thinking about that. And before that, um, Mr. Steinberg brought up the issue of concentration, which is different than my concern because I'd rather have, there's only so many places because of our own zoning. So uh, that happens to be one of the places where it is allowed. So we created the conditions for concentration in some sense. Um, I'm more concerned about how it looks in the design because I think the Green Mile idea from Colorado is a, it's sort of the sleazy kind of um, place. And I, if there's real quality um, design and uh, uh, high-end, you know, sort of business practices, I don't think we're going to have, I doubt if we're going to have much more concentration. And I think it's as much what it looks like and how it presents coming into that gateway. So um, for me, that's an issue rather than just the fact of three on University Drive. Um, but maybe you could speak to both of those things. Well, our facility will definitely have uh, high-end aesthetics. It will not look like a shop out of Colorado with green lights and uh, gr painted green, <laughs> anything like that. Uh, we want to fit into the local area and be known to be a quality, quality shop, quality products, quality services. And we have a rendering here of what the outside will look like. I can you could pass it. We'll, sure, we'll pass it around if you have something to show us. I think there's we also saw a, a version of this last time. You did. In the previous page, it's the current conditions as well, if you'd like to take a look Sorry. at it. Oh, I know what they are. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, as a matter of clarity, uh, you know, to, to deal with sort of this, the concern of the concentration. Um, Massachusetts regulations are a little bit different than Colorado. Colorado lets those companies have uh, a little bit more, shall we say, atmosphere around them. Uh, you can't do that in Massachusetts. What, what, what you're going to see is an attractive building that if you drove by, you wouldn't know what it's being used for. There will be a little sign that says herbology group, but you won't have any kind of a marijuana symbol or anything on it. And so other than knowing if you happen to live here and you know what goes on there, you wouldn't know what's going on there. Uh, and that's deliberate. You, you really, it's, it's just not something, you don't want to cater uh, to any kind of an element that's unwanted in the area. You want people to understand that this is a serious business and this is not a place to hang around uh, for illicit activity. So it's important uh, that the building just sort of fit into the area, uh, which I think, as you can see from the rendering, is the idea here. And of course, I should mention, um, having dr done a lot of host agreements with towns, there will be uh, local hiring preferences, preferences for local vendors, um, so that you know this really does become an active part of the community. I know, um, you know, there would be the the standard sort of community host fees um, that that would be applicable, and I think also, you know, for Jane, you, she's interested in becoming a viable member of the community. So I think there will be other charitable giving and, and uh, things of that nature. But you know, you'll, as I said, the, the host agreement will lay out a lot of these issues very clearly to, to show all of the mm -hmm. benefits. 
Salman, did you want to add add to that? <laughs> about the interior? No, oh. about the sort of some of these qualitative aspects that were. Um, I'm sure you had that discussion already following our last. Yes, meeting. we'll hold more community outreach, uh, public education, for patients. Also, we will have classes within our uh, within the community, you know, to bring the community in and educate them. We feel it's very important for safety, and also um, there's a we feel there needs to be more education within the community too, between adult use and medical, um, for both of them. So, and also inside our facility would be a luxury spa slash medical looked and feel to it. It's not going to be um, just a plain counter. You know, we're, we're catering to everyone's needs, depending on what kind of product they need. We want to educate and guide them for the most, the best safe practices and use. And, and I think the conversation we had at the last community meeting included someone about uh, funding for public education. Yes. Um, which we sp have spoke of, and that's something that we're interested in funding as well. Mm -hmm. And also, we're looking to you know help support any veteran programs, um, women, minority programs, within the community. I missed your April 9th presentation here because I was ill with the flu, but I showed up with a mask at your uh, April 11th <laughs> community <laughs> outreach meeting just so I could contaminate even more of the public um, because I that was basically our first community outreach meeting in Amherst. And so the community outreach meeting, of course, has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, except that it does because everything's connected. So if you could give us a sense of timing associated with, you know, as you mentioned earlier, not everyone, even though the state gives medical a leg up for recreational, that doesn't mean that you'll get through the special permitting process for both medical and recreational. It doesn't mean that you'll get host community agreements for both medical and recreational. It just puts you to the head of the line in terms of the CCC's process. Um, at this point, I think we made it clear at our last select board meeting that it's not something we're considering an automatic leg up here in Amherst. So just given that, and given that some community members did in fact come to your outreach meeting, which yay for you, is what's the expectation in terms of timing, in terms of the application process with the recreational, in terms of what, you know, I realize things always change because we certainly knew with medical, many places wanted to be open long already, et cetera, but it, the reality is this isn't two years ago where you're talking about medical well before recreational was even legal recreational applications are being processed now. So what's the current philosophy behind that since you've already sure. in fact jumped I, through that hoop of the community outreach meeting? Um, so the good thing is that they did jump through the hoop of the community outreach meeting. The more difficult thing is that the state process is very muddled right now. Um, you know, there was the hope that this would be open on July 1st, July 1st passed, there's nothing open. Um, and the other thing that you need to understand is, you know, there are a lot of applications out there. Um, I believe uh, this group has a priority right of review for theirs because they were previously given a provisional certificate of registration uh, for a medical license. Um, and so they will get a leg up, but, uh, you know, to, to, to think that there is any likelihood on the recreational side, and again, we're, we're really talking about medical here, but on the recreational side, I cannot imagine anything even within six months, and I think if I had to guess, a year is more likely. I think the medical would be up and running a lot more quickly. I think, um, you, you know, the knowing the special permit process here a little bit, I, I think you could be looking at something like four to six months conceivably here on the medical side. Um, so I think that's, you know, and there's some build out that has to go on and architectural, even that's a bit optimistic, quite frankly. I think eight months is probably about as soon as you might see that. So, but the, the recreational is further down the line. There's just too much, um, too much uncertainty in the state process. I wish I could give you a better answer to that question, but I'd be, I'd be lying to you if I thought I could be that definitive. Just I want to add, I think it's our strategy to have a complete application before we go to the state, and that means we would need a host community agreement from you. And, and Phil, unless that's changed, right? No. 
Yeah, we were talking about that today. It's better to send a complete application because they don't really review it until they certify that it's complete. And that requires the affirmation of zoning and the host agreement from Amherst. So. Mr. Steinberg. Um, just one, one other different topic. Um, and uh, principally direct this to Ms. Hammond is I uh, appreciate the fact that you have the experience in the military because the whole question of um, training and oversight of multiple locations and making sure that things are done appropriately across multiple locations is something that I'm suspecting that you're used to from your military career. But uh, I was wondering if uh, you've given thought to the administrative structure that you would want to see in place for three different locations uh, within Western Massachusetts and how you as the um, chief administrative officer intend to assure uniformity and quality in everything that you would expect across all locations. We hired, uh, we feel, a great uh, management team that will provide services for us. Um, we feel that they have the best experience. They've hired some of the top leading, uh, they brought together this team from leading companies that were already uh, in Colorado and brought them here to Massachusetts. We feel that they, you know, very educated and, and uh, can put the right team in place to help manage all three locations. And also, I will be here myself in Massachusetts, um, probably, hopefully, Amherst, <laughs> looking for a place. So to help oversee that and make sure everything's smoothly and uh, that our management team is you know, holding the standards that we expect. So. Thank you. Thank you. Follow up there. No. Ms. Brewer, any other questions? Letting them look a little bit, <laughs> in a bit since we. I also have experience running a few different medical practices, alternative care practices. So I have overseen um, me and my family. We started chiropractor, chiropractors. I'm an acupuncturist, uh, physical therapist. We had an office in Connecticut and two in New York State. And um, my sister is a CEO of Herbology Group. She's back there, and she also helped manage those practices. So both of us together, you know, have managed managed more than one business. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm wondering because we, we do have a, a memo in the beginning part of it is, um, from Mr. Kravitz um, gives us a recommendation um, on this issue and I don't know if you want to invite, it, invite him to speak to that. Thank you I for would that like reminder. to hear from him. I just have to find where I put it. Yeah, it looks like, <laughs> looks like all the other memos. It looks <laughs> it's look kind all. of like this. So. <laughs> Mr. Gravis, do you want to offer some comment to us relative to that portion of your memo? We'll get a fuller right. comment on the rest of it later, but. You can use that microphone. Uh, what did you I can say? hover nearby. Well, <laughs> I'll hover. There you go. So um, the recommendation was, was to issue a letter of support or non-opposition um, yes. conditional on Happy Valley withdrawing its application. Since drafting the memo, I had a follow-up phone call with the Department of Public Health, and they informed me that, in fact, they would not accept two applications for the same location. So it, I, I guess I would amend the recommendation to say it doesn't need to be conditional, but that, that would be the only comment, unless you have questions. Inherently conditional by virtue of the state's right, regulation. Right, right. I, I guess my, what I would ask you is, um, just to summarize your thinking in making that recommendation to us. That we issue I, the letter. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, previously it was deemed as an acceptable location for a medical marijuana dispensary. Um, I understand that that was prior to recreational marijuana being established. Um, Despite, despite the assertions here, I, I don't see um, 
for medical marijuana establishments um, being successful in the long term in Amherst. I don't think that there is the market there, especially as it expands and recreational expands in the region. Um, so I think that having um, allowing the market to compete to see which of which of the operators are the best and able to survive, I, I don't sort of a free market argument. Um, so that, that was sort of the, the thinking behind the recommendation. If there we, aren't we, other questions, we could take a motion too, but go ahead. So I have a comments for discussion amongst ourselves That's rather fine. than questions for any of the lovely people who have come right. and spoken to us. That's fine. So you can still hang out because it may involve you still. <laughs> but go ahead, please. So, in addition to all the issues we've already discussed in terms of the long-standing community um, owners of the business that's running at this location now and their contributions to the community, et cetera, that we have heard about over over the last period of time since we talked about this location previously and the acknowledgement that, of course, um, this was all before we knew for sure medical was happening and we certainly didn't know that a Head Start was going to be provided by the state on recreational, that's what I meant to say, recreational adult use. Um, however, as this continues to evolve, I think one of the rationales I'm looking at is, and this is why I'm talking to you guys, not asking them to, to weigh in, is a reason to not issue a letter of support slash non-opposition would be because we absolutely for certain don't want another medical facility and I don't think, although we've, we've had some comments about why we're concerned about numbers, um, I don't think that's true. I don't think that we would that we want to say we absolutely don't want to have a fourth because we don't really know that all four are going to work out, even though others have gotten somewhat through the permitting process um, for medical. Another reason to say no to a letter of support or non-opposition would be to prevent the town manager from from signing another host community agreement. And that, to me, has some validity as a concern because host community agreements were signed with all the other medicals without substantial discussion by the select board on what might be included in those host community agreements. However, it is also true that there's a separate special permit for recreational. There's a separate host community agreement for recreational slash adult use. So I'm feeling less concerned about using blunt tools to do things that we can do with finer grain tools um, later on in the process. It's clear that the town manager has come to us and said he wants to talk to us about host community agreements associated with recreational slash adult use. Um, he's also asking for insight associated with this one um, because we're at this weird cusp of timing. And so given that I'm was hesitant months ago um, for a variety of reasons, including those I just stated. But now that everything is much clearer in terms of the process, in terms of the various input points people can have, even though the town manager can in fact just go ahead and sign whatever host community agreements he wants, he's made it clear that he's interested in talking to us about that. Special permit still has to take place for the separate, and it has been mentioned previously as well as tonight, that in fact not all those locations all lined up on University Drive or even the other location that's located on Meadow Street may in fact get a special permit because parking considerations are different for a retail operation than for a medical by appointment operation. So I'm no longer seeing a reason to oppose a letter of support or non-opposition. Um, I, I am in agreement and I'm wondering uh, if you had an inclination towards support or non-opposition because I'm, I'm thinking of making a motion and I, um, since it's at least six months from, since we did one of these, I'm older, so I'm more conservative. I was thinking of maybe going for non-opposition this time instead of support, but um, it would 
be maybe inconsistent with our previous position, but I was going to make a motion that we could talk about this some more after the motion was made, but I was wondering if you had a preference, if any of the members here had a preference before I put it on the table. I do not yet have a preference and would be interested in people's rationale for so, so the, the difference thing, between the two. The thing that we grappled with relative to that issue in the past was what distinction does it make relative to the state? And we have and yet to understand the how the state sees them, which it doesn't really. Doesn't. I think it may be a bit of a political out for select boards across the Commonwealth to say, oh, it's a non-opposition, which is softer than a support. That's very but as far as effective, you know, I, not a scintilla of difference that right. I can tell. So I don't know that it has a lot of meaning for me either, in, as far as the difference between those two. But um, I will say, just just to piggyback on what Ms. Brewer said, I'm I'm thinking about this. You know, granted, the circumstances we're operating in with uh, adult use being more clearly painted out, I think that the there are a number of of um, rather significant hurdles, both state and local, relative to adult use, and for that matter, relative to, to medical use, that that give us some assurance that there's some uh, additional, you know, uh, public input opportunities and, and, and uh, feedback opportunities for folks to, to give you relative to that. So that gives me a certain level of comfort relative to supporting a, a a letter of support and non-opposition, but um, and I and I don't see again. I don't see a, a, a real strong reason to not allow it. Um, I think the one particular reason is that um, you know it is displacing a business that's currently active, viable, and functioning within our town. The other locations didn't have that, but that's a pretty subtle, you know, sort of thing. I'm uh, sensitive to that, and so you know it, it's. Difficult, but I don't know again that that's a sufficient reason to not offer the letter of uh, from the from the select board. I was I was going to make a motion, but I don't want to. Mr. Steinberg, do you have any comment or offer? So, I'm going to make a motion. Sure. And then we can. I, I have a few other things to perhaps say. Um, I move to provide a select board letter of non-opposition to Herbology Group Inc.'s notice of intent to operate and. Offsite medical marijuana dispensary at 422 Amity Street, Amherst, within a zoning district that allows such use by right or pursuant to local permitting, and further to authorize Doug Slaughter, select board chair, to provide notice of the vote taken July 9th, 2018, on behalf of the select board. Is there a second? Second. Okay, <laughs> there is. <laughs> is there further discussion? Well, just two things. One, um, I, I know in this sort of um, points we talked about for for kind of extra qualitative points, um, using a you know a vacant or abandoned property, this would not be. And I, as much as I would like that uh, existing restaurant business to stay in town and do well, um, that property's in play right now. So we can't because they're not the owner. We we really can't guarantee their longevity in that site right. regardless so right um they just you know in terms of host agreements community host community agreements um there wouldn't be points for using a vacant property um also i'm thinking with special permits we've done this for other um issues including uh, affordable housing We've forwarded our concerns um, as recommendations to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And where this is a pretty new kind of thing, if we had concerns about appearance or uh, conditions around offering things in addition to the money, um, I think we have an opportunity to voice that in a, you know, it's their jurisdiction, but it's not um, unprecedented for us to send our concerns along to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I think um, we didn't do that with the special permits already issued, but now we've plunged more deeply into this issue, I think it would be appropriate to think about doing that. Is there further discussion? It's the only thing that, uh, as I disclosed earlier, and as everybody knows, I abstained uh, when the similar vote 
took place for Happy Valley. Um, and it was not a comment on their business, and it was certainly not a comment either on um, the need for medical marijuana or the desire for recreational marijuana um, to be available in our community, but had to do with uh, the concentration of uh, businesses in one spot, as I said, um, in the major gateway into the university. Um, so I will be inclined to abstain again. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 One person absent. Any abstain. Abstention? One abstention. So we have one abstention, one absent, and three in favor. So thank you all very much. We thank appreciate you. your patience with us. Thank you. Thank you. So next on our agenda, uh, yes, we can. Why don't we take a, a short yes. recess for about five minutes or so, and then we'll come back and, and take up our second okay. half of this topic for tonight. So we're all back. So let's uh, we'll re uh, restart our meeting, and we're going to continue with the topic of, of um, marijuana, and particularly talk about some of the other tools we have at our disposal. And Mr. Kravitz has written us a memo, and so if you'd like to take us through a little bit of that. Um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Jeff Kravitz, Economic Development Director. Um, two weeks ago, we had some discussion of potential options um, regarding host community agreements and um, local licensing for recreational marijuana establishments. And so, Last week, um, I put together the memo dated July 6th, um, and essentially it lays out what I would describe in general as sort of a holistic approach. Um, I know points were mentioned earlier. I don't necessarily see assigning points to any of these, but some of the things that uh, the town manager in consultation with appropriate staff would consider um, in order to evaluate whether or not to sign a host community agreement. Um, things that would include what what's in the host community agreement, um, the percentage uh, for impact community impacts. Uh, as I mentioned at the last meeting, um, other communities have signed things including community benefits that are different, um, as well as uh, charitable contributions. And then some of the other things, uh, the economic benefit of the town regarding jobs, tax revenue, um, the use of vacant or underutilized properties, the appropriateness of the location, um, the quality and distribution of educational material to patients and um, recreational users, the experience of the operators in Massachusetts um, or elsewhere doing marijuana establishments or other similar type establishments, um, the commitment to sustainability, um, which would probably be more for cultivation organizations, but um, power usage, uh, electricity usage, water, sewer, those types of things. Um, and then sort of added a catch-all if, if anybody wanted to try to blow us away with um, something unique and we hadn't seen before that seemed like a really good idea. Figured that was um, worth including as well. Um, and then it sort of goes through some of the material, the host community agreement, um, the location of the business, blueprints, um, and tried to strike a balance understanding that this is the very initial step that most of these businesses would be going through and to require you know, full engineering reports and site plans when they don't even know whether or not they're going to be able to move forward in the process seemed onerous, but having something to base it on um, would, would help that decision-making process. Um, and then sort of a, a summary of um, 
who might help advise the town manager on various aspects of a, an application. So one question I want to start with. Take the chair's prerogative to answer, ask the first question. Oh, did you have something else you want to offer? Just one, one a brief comment. Uh, so the host community, this is a policy discussion that started last at your last meeting, and this is a more developed, and I appreciate uh, the economic development director's memo, which really, I think, comprehensively lays out uh, three, three different things, the medical marijuana, the host community agreement, and then the licensing things. Those are the three things that we're talking about. The host community agreement under re uh, recreational marijuana is a imp really important document now because it's the latch key that allows the applicant to go to the state. It's a major public policy discussion to be had, and that's why I think it's really valuable to have it in this format uh, because it is the one piece that they really need beyond all the site um, plan reviews and things like that. Um, um, but as a policy issue, not as a siting issue, I, that's why I think um, it's really important for us to have this sort of um, conversation about the content and the uh, decision-making process for a, a host community agreement. So the, the first thing I'll ask about, just speaking to that, is that I was thinking, you know, sort of order of events, because I think as it stands now, the host community agreement and the process for special permit are going to potentially be on parallel tracks, simultaneously potentially happening. Um, and, and this is sort of an open question, and I'm not saying I have an answer or preference one way or the other, but it could, could it be, or is there uh, anything that prevents setting a particular order? Do we want to set a host community agreement first, then have them go through special permit process, have them do a special permit process, then do host community agreement? They're going to need both of those to go to the state, I presume. Or do we want to keep them in a, in a, in a parallel track, or do they not need both to go forward with the, with the state? They only need the host community agreement and a community outreach meeting in order to <laughs> submit a complete application to the state. Um, they would need a special permit before they received a, a final license. Um, and also our zoning bylaw, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, requires applicants <coughs> to be at a, a, an appropriate, I forget the exact term, but in a, a certain stage in the state process, which we would interpret to at least be, have uh, submitted an application. Um, in, in the medical process, they had to get to the provisional certificate of registration before the Zoning Board of Appeals would accept an application. Um, this is a different process, so we're not sure, but at least they would have to have submitted an application. Um, so we've essentially set the order of events to have host community agreement first. Well, the state has. In order, yeah. yeah. We have to do yeah. Well, if our zoning was different, though, we could have not made it a requirement to have been in, at a certain stage. I mean, I'm not saying we could or couldn't. I'm, I'm, the reason I ask that question is because you brought up the point of, you know, how for a host community agreement, what level of, of like building design and that sort of thing, location, et cetera, et cetera, is needed. And if you have done the zoning, the, the permit first, you've sort of answered that level of question first. But again, it, it, it I'm not saying it's right to do it one way or the other. It's just wanting clarity on, on, on when things can and should sort of matriculate through. Yeah, it sounds so, as though those, they're, and, they're and I think it is the correct order because, again, the requirements for submitting an application for a special permit are much more onerous than what right. this memo envisions um, and would be more costly to applicants. Right, to. okay. No, that's good. I just wanted to hear that clearly so I wasn't mistaken in, in how I approached approach that um, the one thing I'll bring up I was talking about host you know host community agreements one of the things I've been thinking about a, a, a lot lately um, relative to sort of the educational pieces I think about you know potentially eight different you know we're gonna ask for a certain thing from from uh, you know potentially eight different vendors relative to educational outreach and that sort of thing and I, I got to thinking about it would probably be and and we you know one of the concerns we had is the fact that there's you know a quarter of the population in in the two colleges and university turns over every year and so we have a rather large influx of new residents every year by virtue of the natural progression of, of those institutions so educational outreach is a huge piece and certainly for me as far as uh how that plays out and and so 
I was thinking about you know the idea that we need a sort of coordinated approach to that educational process, and so either uh, their support of our 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 defined educational outreach plan, in, and I would think that would have to be in concert with the, the university and colleges, but also potentially creating um, them as partners in that, and so that it 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 allows them to participate and potentially foster and, and promote new ideas of how to do educational outreach um, so that we're not trying to you know, sort of build it perfectly on our own, but make them a partner in that process. But I do think it's something where I wouldn't want to put the onus entirely on them to create the whole thing because then we'll have eight different messaging, potentially as many as eight different uh, organizations messaging eight different ways, and that could potentially put messages in conflict or confusing and that sort of thing. So I was, I was just uh, wanting to sort of promote that idea of a, a coordinated approach on our part. I don't want to place a lot of burden on us as a community to do that, but I just wanted to think about that idea of it and, and what you thought about that, what the managers thought about that, and what my colleagues have thought about that. So Ms. Well, specifically about education, I think part of the money that we're getting, um, we're going to be asked to use some of that. Um, for education, and I think there does need to be independent education on this that's separate from a provider um, approach. So I've always assumed that some of that outreach and education would be done by a non-licensed, you know, by somebody that we choose or we fund or maybe different groups, whether it's through the schools or through Spiffy or through the some other branch of the town. So I think I, I see a, a purpose in having an independent educator in addition to um, the groups showing they're, they're giving abundant information on um, you know the different medical aspects and other responsible use things. But um, in looking at this, I, I like the criteria, and I was the one who said points earlier, and I didn't, I shouldn't, it's too, too literal, and I just meant like qualitative considerations, and will be diff a different mix probably for each applicant. Um, the thing I noticed, the internal review team helps the manager and then the manager signs the agreement. Uh, no dispersions on um, these uh, positions listed, but I don't see any public officials on the review team. And I know the Board of Health has an interest in these matters. Um, elected official probably won't be this board, but it's successor board. I would like to see some public officials in the mix. I think it brings a different perspective in looking at a value, you know, an evaluation process and a qualitative process. So um, it doesn't preempt these people from having the information, but I'd like to see a role for some public officials as well in terms of providing recommendations or guidance to the manager. This, look, this look, just looks really staff heavy. Uh, just to respond um, to the comment about educational material, I've met with the Board of Health and, and they are also very concerned about education um, and have had discussions about whether it is better for the town to produce it and I don't think this rules out uh, both. This, the, you, if the town says here is the material that we are producing that you have to give to medical patients or recreational um, consumers and you can go beyond that and say that you are going to also do, um, as, as the herbology group said, you know, have classes, have community stuff that, that we would, that the town may not actually require. I, I would say, okay, that in, in my mind, if I were advising the town manager under this policy, I would say that that's a, um, a check mark or a plus on, on that type of application because they're going above and beyond. But yes, if there was a minimum that the town wanted to require, I think that that's um, certainly worth discussing and, and a conversation with the, with the Board of Health on what type, what that material should be in the contents of it. Right. And I think for me, the concern is, you know, and, and you see this with alcohol advertising when they loosen the laws around alcohol advertising. So now you can have you know, all manner of alcohol advertising and they all have to, you know, it's required to have this sort of drink responsibly sort of thing. Some of them do it in a very sort of straightforward, simple way with it just sort of as a tagline on the, you know, television ads. Some of it take a more tongue in cheek approach, which I think is a bit disingenuous personally, but I, I think that that's where I'm, I'm having a little concern about potentially conflicted or mixed messages that come out of, out of that piece of it. I think having 
you know, sort of a baseline thing that we're doing and that they're participating in to, to create and, and promote and pay for and that sort of thing. But I think if we're going to ask for additional beyond that, that, that you know, we may want to have, uh, you know, not a lot of constraint necessarily, but, you know, some, some understanding of intention behind that so that we're, uh, again, not wanting messages to be in conflict with one another. So if one group of, of uh, or one a particular retailer is, is from providing it in one way and another is providing it in a different way, uh, that those don't end up with conflicting messages if, they're, if we're asking for an additional sort of piece of, of public outreach in that regard. So that's really a concern there. Yes. So among the tens of concerns I have about this memo and the details in the memo, um, so I'll buckle in for a while, I would like to talk about specifically about the education piece because I, I do think that's actually not as complex as it could be. Um, I think that we should talk about whether or not it makes sense, and again, as Mr. Kravitz indicated, and Board of Health members have indicated to us through Ms. Fetterman and directly that uh, during our internal working group, that they would certainly, Spiffy may come into it at some point, we could say, for example, we could say, you'll put in what the town tells you to put in, and we'd love to see what else you think is important to put in because then they could be part of informing a better town document moving forward. And they could even work with the people who are working on that town document. And while I realize we don't have suddenly excess capacity amongst staff to do things like this, we, don't, we never had excess capacity to do any of this marijuana work, despite hiring an economic development director who was not told this was gonna be his job when we hired him. So um, it feels like rather than expecting each of them to come up with a separate piece that we think would suit us, that maybe we just go ahead and come up with our piece. Because as Ms. Kruger says, and as we'll attach to one of my other many comments later in the evening, is we get this money for a reason. We are not supposed to just be asking them for all the money we can have because they want to open sooner. That's been a criticism about many municipalities across Massachusetts, and I don't think we're in that position. But we do think we can justify 3%, and at this point there's not a lot of legal guidance as to what exactly that will be, but it has to be defensible. And it feels very obvious to me that educational material that's developed in concert with the universities and colleges, even though it may start out, you know, more quickly in terms of a smaller group, but it will develop over time and it will change over time just as CCC materials have changed over time as to what seems effective in reaching people. And as we learn more from other states that we could require, we could say in the host community agreement, for example, you will provide what we tell you to provide. And, and that doesn't mean they can't tell us, oh, by the way, we're already putting something in there that has five out of those six things on it. Then that's okay too. But we could make it clear that they that I'm not sure how we pay for it in terms of not only the staff time to develop it, but in terms of like actual literal handouts <laughs> and how that works. Um, certainly doesn't go in plastic bags, we know that. Um, but that's obviously something that can be worked out. I don't need to know that level of detail, it feels to me, to be able to say that I would expect a host community agreement to have in town provided material until the town decides some other material because some amazing group somewhere is doing this tradition terrific piece of material that we just send them a they just send us a bill every time they send us another 500 of them right. um, kind of thing the thing I was thinking about is is making you know these were the, these uh, establishments be a partner in the process yes. and so if they have experience in other states right. or other locations we want to strongly encourage sure. them to bring those ideas to us um, because how we do and what we do will need to change over time, um, as is always the case with that sort of thing, but they may also have experience and, and uh, expertise to bring, and so it's encouraging them to be partners with us in that regard um, so that we can be, you know, as we've said before, sort of, you know, uh, responsible stewards as a, as a town around this, uh, around this particular topic because we've got a lot of, a lot of young people in town. Um, you know, we have a certain responsibility to those to those folks, and and it's you know sort of how we go about that. Other things people want to mention or, or would like to bring up in in regard to this, and I've been thinking along similar lines as far as the education piece, which is that the Board of Health really is the appropriate body to 
establish a minimum standard and uh, even uh, a, a platform to use, an educational platform to use, um, is, um, either as baseline or as the as the actual product. I think that's a matter that um, they probably will have the expertise to determine. Um, one of the things that the ties back to then is the host community agreement is to make sure that the host community agreement can and does um, include a provision that um, requires um, is, uh, the, that the uh, provider, the vendor, is going to comply with all present and future res regulations of the Board of Health regarding uh, the uh, operation and including education in the um, sale of marijuana, recreational marijuana. If I could follow up on that a bit, and I don't know if at some point we'll, oh, Ms. Fetterman is actually not with us tonight because um, we didn't expect that. <laughs> um, we didn't expect these guys um, but we had indicated Mr. Moore was going to be available tonight because he couldn't be before. But in terms of, I do, I do just want to caution us that I want to make sure that even if the Board of Health doesn't have a quorum and can't meet to set their regulations, which you know better than the rest of us, but we all know can don't have to go through town meeting or anything. They just, but there's still a process for regulations that is different, a little different and more formal than what we do here when we establish a policy or even a local licensing process. So. I would just caution that we go ahead and make it clear somehow that the town managers, uh, it sounds like our expectation is that the Board of Health would either, as you indicate, provide a baseline or provide the actual material based in concert and working with whoever they want to work with as to what this stuff is. But to say, eventually they're going to have a regulation that says they require educational materials, I don't know what the timing is going to be like on that. And so just to avoid any snafus where somebody's caught up in well, they don't have to do anything because there isn't a regulation yet. I actually want it to be in there, but it could well be that eventually it becomes whatever the regulation says, not only. And then there are other things they're concerned about operationally associated with sanitation and that sort of thing that I know they're going to be working on at some point, but that is separate than this. So on the educational piece, my intention would be to seek funds from the operators uh, to create um, the ability for us to offer the educational programs that we need. These programs would be based out of the Board of Health and out of the school, um, school department because they have interest in educating students of, their, um, of the school district as well, and they've already expressed that interest. So I don't think um, deciding what that educational process is I think the goal here is to establish an adequate source of funding, so it's a recurring source of funding for us to do this at both levels, both for uh, the new people who come to town on an annual basis, but also at the school department for um, rising uh, students as they rise through the grades. But I'm confused. Why wouldn't, isn't that part of the reason, and we're not talking about the excise tax, I'm talking about the traditional, if anything's traditional in this new world, 3% payment that we'd be looking for. Are you talking about in addition to the 3% payment you'd be looking for a revenue stream for educational material? Potentially. Because what Maybe are we going to spend the other 3% on? And I guess is what I'm asking because we haven't lot, talked about that. We haven't, if we just want to recover our costs that we've invested so far in this whole marijuana process, it would take us about three years of 3% okay. to get to there. Um, this would, uh, in addition, to um, the 3%, which is just the ongoing maintenance cost, basically. Um, we'd be see, I think most of the uh, providers who've come before us have in, been interested in providing really good quality uh, educational material for us, and I think that's, that would be something that would resonate with all the providers. So to follow up, you're looking for a separate revenue stream from the provider in the host community agreement, which would fall under community benefit payment, I presume as opposed to community impact fee, which is the traditional 3%. Yeah. And then, but when you say, of course, I, I'm con I don't want to misstate what you said. We've all heard indications that they're interested in providing high quality materials, but wait, 
are they providing them or are we saying what they should include? Now I'm lost because I understood the part about Board of Health and Schools. They want to provide materials, but what we want from them at this point is money and then them to actually provide the materials that we give them. I'm confused. Okay. What I said is we want money so our Board of Health and School Department can put together the educational, educational materials, materials that they feel is appropriate for our community. Not and that we're going to get a branded thing from a right. provider. Exactly. But each of them, is, from my experience, has been that they were totally open and supportive of education as being a key component of their mission, as we heard by the urology <coughs> group. And so, in theory, as you work with the Board of Health and the schools, you could ask them, hey, you told me that you were interested in this. What do you think of this? But like you say, it won't be their branded material. It'll be our material. Right. Right. Other comment on education? Because I... And I just think that, yes. and I, I think because we're a unique, not unique to the world, but because we have an influx of thousands of students every year, that makes the demands on education significantly higher than almost any other community. Right. I think that's part of why it's been raised at the level it has for us, right. I think, in particular. But um, since Mr. Kravitz raised the question of sustainability, given the potential use of, of resources to run these establishments, depending on what kinds of things. Um, of course, what crosses my mind is that we, revi we passed and then revised the town bylaw relative to net zero. Um, do we want to, and I'm posing this as a question, I don't have an answer for this. I don't, you know, I, I can think about, I can argue either side of this about whether or not we want to um, put some sort of stipulation relative to sort of energy use and sustainability into an agreement, um, not just articulating what, what they have or their commitment, you know, commitment to it's one thing sort of having particulars, uh, benchmarks that they're trying to achieve or need to achieve or are trying to achieve, um, you know, are we, has anyone thought about that and, and whether or not we want to pursue that or does that start to become too difficult a burden to place on, on an organization early on. I'm just sort of, you know, like, so for example, one of the struggles we had with a net zero building is whether or not you can even do that for certain kinds of buildings that we were talking about. So do we, do we think that putting that level of, of criteria is too high a criteria? Do we want to, what, what and how would we frame a conversation about sustainability if we were going to have one relative to this and guiding our, guidance to our, our manager? I like the idea of considering that as one of the contributions to the community if they want to put in solar panels or whatever and they can take credit or a special water recycling plan or whatever. I would really object to seeing that as requirement. We don't require pharmacies to come up with a solar plan. This is a new industry and I think right. that could be crippling and we don't even know how it would work and we don't even know if and how it will work for town buildings but it was um, Pass, so therefore we'll figure it out. But I, I would not. I would. I don't mind considering that as bone. You know, hey, you're gonna, you, you have a big site and you're gonna put some solar in so that you're, you know, sending energy back to the grid. But I think it would be a big mistake to create a criteria that required it. My opinion. I don't know how anyone else thought about it, but I just I want to raise it as a question. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mr. Simon. No, I thought about the similar question as to why. Uh, we would single out one type of retail industry for energy as opposed to all of the other kinds of um, retail industries that exist already in the community and will exist in the future. And uh, so I was, uh, I'm hesitant for that reason, which is I think similar to what Ms. Kruger was saying. If we had, however, somebody coming to us which I don't foresee wanting to establish a grow operation that um, used a tremendous amount of utilities relative to other kinds of um, businesses in the community, uh, then I would be uh, very much wanting to have that conversation more deeply. I mean, part of why I raise this is one of the points that was made to me as we've had the conversations about net zero energy buildings for the town 
uh, sort of imposing that on ourselves as a town as we build new buildings and renovate buildings. But one of the things would suggest is whether we start to move in a direction where all new buildings, whether they, which is a really difficult thing because that would include all homes and all businesses and all any, you know, sort of uh, construction. There are some that would suggest that, you know, moving to a town-wide uh, net zero sort of direction is, is a direction some people would want to pursue. I'm not saying we should, could, uh, would, or, or any of those, but, but there are folks that will promote that idea. So that while this would be a singling out because it's, but because it's new, it's, a, it's an opportunity to sort of see that. That's part of why I raised that. I don't, I agree. I think that it's, it currently, given that it's such a new industry, it's hard to, to sort of place that criteria. And I think having that other conversation about a broader approach to sustainability and what uh, constraints we would, as a community, put on our community members, whether it be residential or, or commercial, um, is we're not there yet, I think, as far as the, that's such a complex and deep and expensive at this point process. So the, the major policy um, quandary that I am in at this point is um, given our zoning, uh, there are areas where once a marijuana, recreational marijuana facility goes in, another one can't be located in the same area. And so, for instance, in the downtown area, there's only one location, one area, uh, multiple properties where a marijuana, recreational marijuana facility could be located. And, there are, and, and the question is, suppose there are multiple people interested in developing these multiple sites, how do we decide which one um, gets a host community agreement? Because only one is going to come, um, come to fruition. Is it, do we sign multiple host community agreements and let them, is it, is it the first to market? Um, is it the um, one that provi provides the greatest economic benefit to the town? What criteria do you think are valuable in terms of, and, and do we do an RFP process to say, hey, we're, we have one to give out, come to, come to market right now? Or do we wait for applicants to come to us? Those are the things that we've really been struggling with because we don't have, it's, there's no clear answer to that. Um, it, it's a tangible question now because, we, uh, because the town has adopted zoning. Uh, that creates this um, challenge in the downtown area, uh, which is, which from all intents and purposes seems to be a very um, desirable location to be in as opposed to uh, other locations. And I know that um, Jeff Kravitz has thought about this a, a fair amount. I'm not sure if you want to weigh in on what the, what the, what the considerations the board should have on how to approach that. I, I think you summarized them. Well, um, you know, one, one of the interesting things that I read today is, I forget if it's Cambridge or Somerville, and obviously we couldn't do this right now. I think, pretty sure it would require changing to our zoning, but they're considering waiving the 300 foot buffer requirement for um, minority or women owned businesses. Um, and to sort of help in that in the congested areas and, and allow those businesses uh, provide them with some sort of advantage. Um, again, that, that doesn't help us today, but it's just food for thought going forward. But I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's um, how, how do we determine, you know, who's just saying, hey, this is a new industry. I heard it's a gold mine in Colorado. I'm gonna st I want to start a business and Amherst seems to be supportive of it and there seems like a young population that would, um, my business could do well there. So I have some money, I'm gonna throw it at a lease and, and try and get a license um, versus someone who may have experience running a business um, in another state and really understand the industry and, and be able to uh, have a successful and um, long running business in Amherst and, and become a good community partner. Screw her. Oh, well, I wanted to ask Mr. Buckman, doesn't this, I know it's not all finalized, but doesn't this array of qualitative issues to evaluate give you some tools to, and having the advisory group, doesn't that give you some tools to differentiate? I mean, you're, you're never gonna get, cause you're gonna get them over a couple of years and you can't, compare the one that's going to come in two years from now to the one that's right in front of you now. But um, if you had a few in the next six months, this gives you some tools to differentiate. 
No, I, th I think I think all the issues have been identified. I think that um, this is a sort of a unique industry because it's 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 fast moving and it's not it's and it's it's maturing. It's not mature yet. We don't know what it's going to look like, uh, and there's a scarcity of geography because of the the rules that we have to follow. So when you have scarcity of resources, you say, well, you know, how do we allocate that that public this is a public benefit. The, the host community agreement, in essence, is a public something that we're going to give to somebody. And how do we do that in, as a public policy matter? And that's um, and whether we say, here's, here's an area we want it. We want a residential marijuana. Come to us with your best proposals. Here's our criteria we're going to evaluate on. You, you do the best that you can do. Um, and Or is it we're just going to sit here and wait for people to walk in the door and whoever's first in, you know, but I, th I took a, a lesson from your last meeting where you said just because you have medical marijuana does not give you precedence over any other uh, recreational marijuana. So that was really good direction from the board to say that's not a, you don't get a leg up because of that. In fact, that's where we disagree with that in some ways. So that was helpful for us to have that clarity. So that's the type of clarity I think we're seeking, or just to, I don't think you're gonna make a decision tonight, but, to, but I think you know, the urgency that was expressed in Mr. Kravitz's letter that people are anxious and, 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 we need, and it's helpful for us to have more um, guidance for people who are interested in this because Jeff gets calls pretty much every day from somebody. So maybe it's the time to start throwing all my remaining concerns at the wall, which one of which I want to make sure as we move forward in writing with with items like this, and this is so helpful to have this level of detail, is that I see a very huge difference between the types of businesses. And so while yes, host community agreements are required, and we even have here this great list from Mr. Kravitz of retail businesses, cultivators, product manufacturers, independent tech lab, and a micro business, we are not talking about an independent testing lab or a cultivator or a product manufacturer locating in downtown in the limited space we're talking about. We're talking about a retail outlet. That is a whole different situation in my opinion. And so I would not want to make it seem as though we are applying the same set. We might be applying a subset of the criteria to those issues, just like we are not going to be looking for a it's been my understanding up to this point, uh, for the kinds of money contributions from those things because we expect them to have a much smaller impact on our resources as opposed to a retail store, right. um, as opposed to a medical uh, by appointment place. And so I think it's really important that we not think of host community agreements, even though we they do apply to all the things, that they're not the same kind of host community agreement for all the things. And then I think another issue that I'm really wondering about, and I'm glad that Mr. Moore is here, even though he's not going to like it, that I'm going to potentially ask Mr. Bachman to put him on the spot, is that there's a whole section here, starting on page two, going on to page three, talking about the process shall include what materials shall supply so the town manager can adequately evaluate whether to sign a host community agreement. I don't think 70% of this belongs in that application process to the town manager the blueprints, the security plan, the odor control plan, the business plan, traffic, I don't see how any of that has anything to do with the host community agreement. I see that as being all issues, and I could be wrong and happy to be <coughs> corrected by staff. I see those as all issues that are, one, absolutely mandated by the state. You, you have a certain level of security, you have to do a certain level of odor control you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to address those things with the state. And we're certainly not better at evaluating those things than the state is. If people wanna do extra, then that maybe is a bonus situation. But all those things have to be done for the state. And so asking people to come up with all those plans in parallel with their, when they can't actually turn it into the state yet, is similar to me to the idea of we don't make them get the special permit first before they go to the state. We just have to verify that yes, it's within the zoning. It doesn't mean they're gonna get the permit, but it's within the right zoning zone. So I can see a host community agreement. I'm really interested in going back and talking a little bit more about this RFP process because I've always been uneasy about it from the standpoint that we don't own the properties. So like how does that even work, right? But 
assuming there is a way, because it was done, it seemed to have been done elsewhere, um, to say this is the general zoning for the area. There are theoretically properties in there that we could have one of these retail things in. Send us your best information. Does feel a lot more like we're only going to get one downtown. And so to say you can, it's just first in is who gets it doesn't really feel all that great. And so an RFP process that sounds like the way to do that, and then, but to not have all this stuff, because all this stuff is going to be handled eventually by, in most cases, Zoning Board of Appeals. And so any concerns people have that they feel like they should be doing more than the state requires them to do can be handled as Ms. Kruger, not only our board, but I mean the general population can say, given that location, I think the state standards are too low you should do more, and then that could be part of the condition for their permit. I, I don't see why they would need to submit all that in order to get a host community agreement. So I appreciate that it was all laid out, but I'm thinking maybe we can shift it. So as I, as I mentioned, the host community agree agreement is the latch key that opens the door. Right. And um, if someone comes in and, they, and offers a lot of money, whatever the criteria are, I don't know how you can evaluate a plan of action without looking at what the plan is. You know, if they don't, if they don't say what kind of materials are going to use to build the facility or what kind of economic impact they're going to have other than sort of words, I think that um, we're going to want to know what's this, th if, before we issue it, if we have competing um, plans out there, we're going to want them to compete and actually show what they're intending to build. Um, you know, security plan and odor control, maybe that's a different issue. But in terms of what they, they're going to do to the building, uh, I think that's critical uh, in terms of, um, it's just like in terms of what the value is to the town, because we're looking at, if we're saying economic development is one of the criteria, we're going to want to know how much are you investing in the building? What are you doing to the building? Those types of things. Mr. Steinmer. I guess I would add that um, my concern that we uh, find a way of make, of doing some pre-screening because we don't want to negotiate and um, execute a host community agreement with a business that we know or believe is going to be incapable of completing the process and getting the authorization out of the uh, Cannabis Control Co Commission. And uh, so a lot of what I saw uh, Mr. Balcom and, um, and Mr. Kravitz suggesting as screening criteria were really things that um, would give us a comfort level that we have a proposal from a business that is um, showing that it is going to be able to get through the process to an end result so that we don't end up um, wasting more their resources, but more importantly, what could be our opportunity, because um, we lose the opportunity um, then and all the businesses go to a neighboring town. Um, we could not have anything in downtown in the future if the one that we say the fir um, in the door um, doesn't get through and uh, never becomes an operating business that we want to see. I'm totally confused. Mr. Kravitz, one. Uh, and, and maybe plan might have been too strong a word in the memo, but what I was thinking is, for example, if somebody wanted to buy the Antonio's building, recognizing that there's a tiny alleyway. Is there going to be, even if they're not required to have security cameras on that alleyway, will they provide it? You know, making sure that they understand where their location is within the greater scheme of the community. Similar to odor plans, um, an establishment could be in a mixed-use building. I would want to, to know that, that their odor mitigation um, is different than, for example, um, not, not to pick on anyone, but for example, in, in uh, an agriculturally surrounded area um, where the neighbors are a quarter of a mile away, um, 
just re again, sort of more recognizing where the location is in proximity to other surrounding uses, and that that they had they knew that they had to address those um, moving forward. Ms. Kruger. A couple of things. Um, I think we do need a, uh, enough submissions to be able to make a good decision. But I, and maybe it's just the you know the language, like you know, some of this is going to come up with the ZBA or the site plan review or, or special permit and to have it be a mini special permit to that level and maybe part of it's just the language is suggesting that but it could you know um, a copy of blueprints or this or that maybe we just come up with what level of drawing is required in order to know or uh, a narrative about the improvements to the bill I mean it's just to make people go through the hoops that they are going to have to do when they get to the special permit before they even know if they're going to get the host agreement. Um, it, and we just, you know, what are the unique uh, criteria, uh, unique features of this site, the alley? How are you going to, you know, identify any unique criteria and say how you're going to address them? That, that might make sense. But some of this, and I think it's just because it's the first draft, can be massaged so you're not duplicating like front-loading a special permit type of review and then doing all this and then having them come back. And um, again, as I mentioned, we can ask the ZBA to have certain conditions that we think are important. Either they're stock conditions or they're specific to a particular site where a concern has been identified. So, so could I just get to sort of the nub of the matter? Are you liking the idea of an RFP process for um, geographical areas that could only accommodate one recreational and I, and I, I appreciate the differentiation between re, res, uh, recreational retail sales versus all the other mm -hmm. things I think that's a really yeah. good point to, to differentiate um, is is that a process you think or um, or is it whoever shows up and and makes the pitch whoever's ready gets gets to move forward since you're looking at me and um, <laughs> just, um I, I like an rfp like process but i'm worried we could get really stuck in the details and it could take us six months so there's a way to maybe be rfp light where we say this is what we're looking for and we're looking to give out one host agreement in the next six months but not something that could actually get out the door in a month or two not forever so part of the host community agreement process with an RFP, I'm not 100% convinced, and maybe other people have stronger feelings about this, that you wouldn't sign more than one, that you would ask for proposals, and you might find two that are perfectly reasonable proposals mm -hmm. for that site. You sign both, and you see then which one of them figures it out. I don't think we're doing an RFP process in order to guarantee someone a spot. We're, we're, we're doing an RFP process in order to prevent ourselves from just being stuck with whoever shows up first. And so I would argue that we don't need, it. I'm just kind of flabbergasted by the idea that this same memo says, oh, it's going to be a significant undertaking to develop a local licensing process, and yet you're talking about doing a ZBA process with people who aren't the ZBA prior to an host community agreement being signed. That just makes no sense to me. We don't have, you are not the arbiters as to whether or not it's the right material for a building. We don't ask CVS that. We don't ask restaurants that. We keep picking on CVS because they sell opioids. Um, I, I'm really confused by that. I understand people saying, I would do these things. Like, I would make it amazing for these reasons. They might say more than they actually end up doing once they get further through the process. Um, I can't believe that the CCC wouldn't look at the alley by Antonio's and say that you had to put a camera there or that Chief Livingstone would have done so at some point too. And so this idea that they have to figure all that out before they even get into the process and that we're going to leave all that to staff time that we say we don't have because we can't put it on a local licensing process is just like amazing to me. And so I would really like to hear that we are talking about something that's much more like this RFP light concept that talks about all the important values we've talked about. Let them talk to us about job create, you, I should say, not us, about job creation and other things and consider signing more than one if you have good input from people because maybe you have two very different ideas 
but they both seem like good ideas. And it's not up to you to decide. It's up to the C to see if they do the CCC. It's up to the ZBA. I, I don't think the, while I think it's a linchpin because we know it's part of the process, you have to do it in order to get your application complete. And there are people who have pieces of applications mm -hmm. and it makes a lot more sense for them to just do it this way. Um, I'm really uneasy about setting up a whole secondary process for an HCA that is an awful lot like the CCC's process and an awful lot like the CBA's process when what we're really trying to get at are other things, things that the ZBA isn't going to do, like how many jobs are you creating? And why is this spot, why, how, you know, are you going to have three employees there? The other place says they're only going to have two, and the other place says they're going to have six. Explain that to us, and maybe we'd like that. Right. So I think of, um, so back to the original question about a, an RFP process, I think in this initial stage, it has the advantage of creating a coherent way for you guys to approach it because you can say all right we need to have by uh, I don't know August 15th everybody's in for this first location or for for a location in the downtown because that sounds like the ones you've gotten queries about but that uh, but then do you do an RFP process for the other places in town that have a lot more flexibility around the zoning um, so I think that's that's one question but I, I do think having that allows uh, a certain coherency and an economy of your time and, and staff time around the issue. So I think that there's some advantage to that. I worry about does it advantage or disadvantage certain folks by doing that? And that's really what I would be, when I'm thinking about it, something like that, how do we construct it in a way that doesn't overly advantage or disadvantage any particular group just to, to because if, you know, there might be somebody really great that comes along a week later that you know we don't necessarily want to disadvantage because they didn't find out in time or that sort of thing. But the people who have the advantage are people who have site control. So right. if they own the land that and they can and they have and it's zoned appropriately, they're the ones who have the advantage and have the opportunity if they so choose to move this industry in, the, in their location forward. Um, what happens when you have two or three or four property owners? who all are saying that we want to have this thing, which is a lucrative tenant to have, um, and we only get to pick one. Literally, we get to pick one. We can say we want the CCC to decide, but that's not what the CCC is deciding. They're deciding, can you function as a medical, as a recreational marijuana facility in that location? They're, they're backing off on what, if it's the right location or the right developer or whoever. So it really is, and I know the ZBA will look at um, the building designs and stuff, and that's, you know, but that's not, they're not looking at who is the developer, owner, which developer has the greatest economic capacity to, when we say yes, we wanted someone who has the economic strength to bring it to market, um, and who's going to have the big, biggest economic impact on the town. And I don't think we're just talking about number of jobs created, we're talking about what are some externalities that could come out of this that might benefit the town? I'll make, I'll make up something up because it's not real. Suppose someone says, we're gonna come in and put in a medical marijuana facility and we're gonna build you a garage. Would that be pretty attractive to us? Probably, but that's not what anybody said and that's not, I'm just throwing that out because it's so outlandish. But you know, that would be something that would be a, something that we would say, wow, that's really valuable to us as a community. It benefits lots of people, not just this one developer, not this one property owner. So how we value all these things uh, is really important, I think, because it is a limited resource that we have that we can allocate. I would say just to the point, and I'll, I'll get to you guys mm -hmm. in a second, but to the point of, of site control, because that conversation comes up when we talk about uh, development of affordable housing, that sort of thing. Um, you know, are there other things we want to leverage? Um, so the, the, you know, the point that was made earlier tonight from, from herbology, it's like women-owned minority business does that have or carry greater weight relative to this? In other words, so there may be a greater economic viability of a different person with site control exactly. someplace mm -hmm. else. You know, do we value that in a yeah. way that we advantage them differently or, or evaluate them differently? Um, uh, there's another thing I was going to think about, right? site control. Um, shoot, I can't remember. Oh, hopefully I remember it in a minute. Anyway, Mr. Steinberg, I think you were ready to offer a comment. Yeah, no, I, I agree with the site control and uh, the 
ability to uh, have a place to do a business. And um, I, my, my guess is that the companies are going to come in who are interested in the downtown location and try and work with the landlord fairly early to lock that in if, um, from the business owner's point of view. Uh, and so we may not be having the flexibility that we think we have, but I think it's important that we have the process and that we make sure that we are being as fair as possible and considering as many of these different criteria. One additional criteria that then comes up is what is the economic viability of the proposed company? Um, not every company is going to come in with the financing capacity and um, sort of the, the capital to sustain the startup of a company. And where does that fit into this discussion and should that be a criteria? Ms. That was exactly the point I wanted to talk about because both Mr. Bachman and yourself mentioned this earlier. I am really concerned that if we're going to look and dive into the financial viability and the idea that we're going to decide who can get the permit and the license that we are definitely weighting this towards big business and fat cats. And I don't think we want to do that. We don't do that with any of our other businesses. We don't do that with housing. The state, when they're lending, does look at the ability to, you know, for the financing and the background and the leverage and all this complex financial stuff. The lenders do that. We don't do that. So I don't know how we're going to all of a sudden be the, the deciders of who can get all the way through the process. And I think we maybe want to look at some of that based on background and experience. But I, I'm worried about that as a slippery slope. And I, something is, uh, troubles me about that. And I really think we need to treat this business the same way we permit other businesses. Um, that can, you know, when we, we've had, restaurants here um, that have since gone out of business and I heard their plan and I was like, well, that's six months and they're gone. We don't decide, Common Vic, on whether we think they're going to be successful or not. It's just, I don't know where else we decide who has the financial wherewithal and how we would even determine that. Right. I think the other thing I would add, just I remember my other point, <laughs> but but it I does it gets it, it well it piggybacks a little bit on both of what they they said, and we talk about sort of other community benefits. So you know another thing, you know, sort of another hook would be to say, oh well, then would you like to support affordable housing by donating to our affordable housing trust? Mm -hmm. But does that then again advantage a particular deeper pocketed organization, um, or do we weigh that? against say you've recruited a minority owned you know you as the landlord perhaps have recruited uh you know a minority women veteran owned business mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. start start up and you're going to sort of bankroll them you know do we do we value both those in a way and those are both mm -hmm. equally valuable that doesn't necessarily predispose to to a uh, a deeper cash reserve necessarily but i do i do think we want to potentially think about um, those kinds of qualitative other pieces. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's a, a single set or a single thing or a single list of things that might, you know, be able to be art articulated necessarily. Ms. Brewer. So a reason to do the RFP process, which does not have to result, in my opinion, in only signing one mm -hmm. HCA, but the reason to do it is because otherwise what we are going to get is likely an out-of-state developer, big pockets, who's going to be coming in and will be first in line. So this is eminently clear. It's also true, and I'm really hesitant to be careful about the way I say this because I know the press is present. I am in no way implying anything against herbology. I am totally trusting their scenario. However, we all know that in other parts of life, where people have said, oh, it's a minority-owned business, oh, it's a woman-owned business. It's just a checkbox for a huge investment company. What we are talking about in addition to that, which I'm very happy with their biology, it's great. What we are talking about in addition to that is we're missing the whole social equity focus that was supposed to be happening here. And if we don't do an RFP process, I guarantee you we won't get anybody that will meet the social equity process. Now, it may still be because Financially, the burden is going to be tough when you only got one place to retail. You know, people have talked about the fact that other types of entry into the entire marijuana 
adult use recreational business is probably going to be more accessible to people who have traditionally been underserved by banks and large capital investment firms. At the same time, if we do this RFP, we'll, we will have at least tried to accommodate that. Theoretically, the CCC is writing some guidance on how to do this. I believe Commissioner Title is especially interested in do it, trying to do this and help municipalities figure this out, and I know Mr. Kravitz is familiar with that work. But I do want to just, again, emphasize that the CCC has told us, don't expect these applicants to look like other applicants. They're not going to have a very smooth presentation. They're not likely to look like they have as much financing behind them, et cetera. But that was part of the point of this whole thing, was to try, even though I'm arguing on one hand, I don't want to treat it different than other businesses, this business, part of the reason this passed at the ballot was a, were social justice and equity reasons. And the CCC has tried really hard, although they haven't yet written the guidance for municipalities, to figure out how to benefit disproportionately impacted communities, of which we are one. Mm -hmm. We, in fact, are one of those communities. So we can put that in the RFP. And the CCC will take that into account. And so we don't have to just wait for that person to show up. We can try and find that person by doing the RFP process. And I'm a lot more interested in what they're trying to accomplish associated with this first section of benefits than I am that they're gonna tell me about their odor control plan because they're gonna have to figure that out later if they're gonna be able to make it through the process. Mr. Kravitz, sorry. Um, two things, one, on the RFP process, especially if it's not gonna be narrowed down to a single person, then we're really not avoiding the, the issue that we're trying to avoid, which is then it becomes a race. If only one can exist and we issue, if sign two or more host community agreements, it's still a race, whoever gets there first. So I just wanted to clarify that. The second is um, we talked about deep pockets versus not deep pockets. You know, and, and there was a discussion an hour ago about the interior of Herbology's building and the exterior of their building and what it was going to look like and whether or not they were going to do redevelopment. And so I think to the town manager's point about we're looking for direction, at least I'm getting mixed messages about, well, is it okay if they're, you know, a, a social equity applicant that they are you know, in an office with just a counter, but if they have deeper pockets, we expect them to have a higher standard of the building. So, I mean, are we looking at these things or are we not looking at them? So I, I'm Mr. Sandberg, did no. you want to go first? Because you were. Yeah, you said less than me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, uh, as far as the question of analogizing it to the common Vic thing where an infinite number of restaurants can open and choose to succeed or fail. I don't think we're there. I don't think that's analogous to the situation where we have, because of our zoning limitations, a limited number of spaces that can um, qualify under our own zoning rules. And that creates a shortage, a shortage creates um, a um, whole different set of competitive criteria. And I think that's what was behind the site control comment from Mr. Bachelman a little bit earlier. And uh, so we do have to think about this differently from just saying, um, gee, let's let everybody in the door and who succeeds, succeeds, um, and this is a capitalist system and that's how it should work. I ideally would like to believe that that's true, but I think that our zoning has um, now precludes that. I just want to, I think the kind of clarity you're looking for is different than a comment. I very much care about co-located medical and adult use having really paying attention to the medical. And this is a first stop. So when we put, when we say things like that, it's a message to an applicant to go in that direction they still have to go through many, many more hoops. So it's just like Mr. Steinberg always does the thing about the liquor license. It's part of the education process and clarifying what our values are. If you think I was looking at that plan, I couldn't see any of it. <laughs> no. Well, I was not looking at the facade. I mean, I've seen their rendering and it's gonna change. 
this was messages about this is this is something I care about and it's going to come up again and maybe that's a comment I would pass on to the Zoning Board of Appeals or whatever. So it's a little bit of steering, but it's not the whole pie. It's not the kind of fine tuning that you would see later um, with these different stages of, of review. So just to be clear, so don't be mixed message about that because that is just an opportunity here to have a conversation with an applicant to say, this has come up before, this is something I think I care about, and I said it was for me, but maybe this board does, and to give direction early on in a process, sort of like dropping little crumbs along the path. Um, but that was not, and somebody else said about, you know, the investment or how much are you gonna put in. That's a different issue, whether it's appropriate at this stage or not, I don't know, but um, we're really wrestling with how to get the best, some of it is going to be a race. I mean, I sort of agree with Ms. Brewer that there could be more than one, that the, they may be, dip, this gives us this, but this gives us, often in, when you're deciding between two consultants, you want to combine them. It's like, oh, I like this and I like that. And you have to make a decision. So it might be, you, you've passed the bar of our minimum requirements, or you maybe have reached this even higher bar, and so there may be more, of, more than one of you, and you're different, that meet that higher bar. And I don't know that we're going to have, um, exact clarity in it is new. Yes. So uh, I guess one of the things I would like, maybe you could probably figure out where we are on this. And, and the, for the way this is set up is host community agreements is taking priority over licensing. And um, because that's where the need is from the applicants, because licensing is optional, host community agreements is mandatory. Now we could say we need to take a step back and many communities are doing this and just saying, we're not doing, and communicate out to the, the industry, we're not doing anything until we get our house in order in terms of the host community agreement and the licensing. So we're gonna take a step back, come back and visit us in January or some other time when we get things squared away. Um, but that's not the read I got from so at least the internal working group or somebody, I forget who, but. The, or the editorial. The, yeah, well, <laughs> maybe the editorial. <laughs> Had I read it, I would agree with you, but um, the, uh, but the essence of the, was that we want to, this is an industry, that there's an opportunity for the community, that it's something the community supported, that we should be pursuing, not pursuing, we should accept, be accepting the interest in it. Um, and in order to sequence that level of work, Host community agreement takes priority over licensing. If if the board feels like we need both before we can move forward, we should say that'd be helpful to know right now, because uh, that would change our schematic in terms of our time frame on these things. So I'll offer my opinion about that. I think that the uh, the host community agreement is not admitting of delay. Um, in in that, I think that we need to move that ahead, and that is a process that everybody has to do. So I think we need to get that framed up for people. I think we also need to give our uh, our intent about licensing. I think, uh, as 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 uh, Mr. Kravitz outlined here, I think it's a trickier bit of business to to do. I think we haven't done as much on it, so there's we've got to sort of work through that, and it's going to take longer. And I think it's more difficult to make an argument for that relative to the charter transition. I think it's going to be something where I think we have an opportunity as select board to sort of tee that up for next. Um, but I think we, what I would suggest is, in my own thinking about this is that, um, you know, give good guidance relative to host community agreement, move ahead on that, let people start in their process and keep moving, but with the understanding we, we're likely to do a licensing, um, I would suggest we are going to do one mm -hmm. because I think there's an enforcement component that we need to have relative to, you know, if someone's a bad actor, we want to be able to pull the plug. And host community agreement's not going to let you do that probably. Uh, ZBA is not going to be able to do that. I mean, there's some ways in which they can, but not very many. Um, so, you know, if uh, so, I think that the, it it would be hard to put some of that into a host community agreement. Maybe not appropriate, but licensing is the right place. So, I think there are some things around licensing we can do. I don't think we're going to get there with this group because mm -hmm. I just don't think a we, we're going to have the capacity to do that, and b I think it's more appropriate given the transition to sort of prepare as much as we can and then, and then deliver that to them for, for action as soon as possible once they, they take office. Um, but I think host community agreement, we do want to keep things moving along in that regard. Um, and I think that, that um, my suggestion, and it may be 
my colleagues may think differently around the license. I think we should have it. I just don't think we're going to have it before December 4th. Mm -hmm. But they should expect, I think, the likelihood of that to be a piece of the puzzle as they go through. Um, Mr. Steinberg. Yeah. No, and to immediately follow up on that, I think there's a question that I've been pondering, and that is, if a host community agreement is entered into and um, then it goes through the entire process before we create a licensing, can licensing be applied retroactively to the businesses that are already um, established and running? Um, can you have in a host community agreement um, a provision that makes the any future licensing which is containing unknown conditions applicable and um, I don't know the answer to that I don't think that we can discuss that tonight without getting our own independent legal counsel on that subject unless we already have done so and uh, so I don't I, I can um, as, as lawyers sometimes do raise issues, but don't always provide <laughs> answers, and that's one of them. Thanks. Uh, and uh, the other um, then tangential thing I've mentioned it before is that um, I do think that one of the questions about licensing is that um, in the end, what we are after is to make sure that if our enforcement mechanisms, most likely through our police department, find violations, what um, avenues do we have to take action um, immediately without going through a, a separate state process? Do we have the authority to come in and um, revoke a right to do business, and can that in some manner be incorporated in the host community agreement as opposed to an unknown future licensing process that we all agree isn't going to happen between now and um, December when the council replaces the select board. So it isn't up to the council whether or not to have a local licensing process. That's actually going to be up to the licensing commissioners whether or not to have a local licensing process, although they will surely want to talk to the council about that. So it's not like we're just passing it off to the council because that's not the council's area it's somebody else's um since well since it's no longer the same body that's the local licensing authority as we are currently i have asked about this at least twice before as to whether or not we could legally compel someone who signed a host community agreement to follow new licensing requirements i don't know that we've gotten an answer from kp law but that has been brought up in public session before and in private conversation. So I agree. We need an answer to that. We have needed an answer to that. We also need to know the difference between what is legally possible to do and what is preferable to do, which of course, as I believe I made the analogy of the town manager contract, which is that town managers prefer not to sign contracts of one year in length. <laughs> they prefer to sign longer contracts, which is totally reasonable on their part, even though you have community members who are like, ah, just give them a year. Um, Similarly, host community agreements can be up for five years, but they don't have to be for five years. But that's part of the negotiation, right, is how long is it for? So if we legally can't say you will future in future have to follow a local licensing process, then I'd say their HCA is only good for a year. But if we can say it, then even though they may not prefer to sign one that says that, I'm hoping that that is not enough of something to say, ah, well, then we'll just go to Hadley. So that's certainly one of the concerns, and that does definitely need to be defined, and I, I do see it's here on page three of the memo, acknowledgement that it may be subject to local license requirements in the future. Your point about enforcement, which I know is a particular concern of Mr. Slaughter's as well, as he said, is tricky because they only hired their first enforcement person in charge of enforcement at the CCC like six weeks ago. And so they have a lot of ramping up to do to figure out, although they've assured me they're not gonna be underfunded the same way ABCC has traditionally been. So what will be, we be able to do, right? Versus what they do, just like now with ABCC. So that is definitely yet another portion of that that may even need to be called out separately than local licensing. Because local licensing can be anything, in fact, 
I had to work pretty hard to get some people to remember that local licensing is not zoning. Local licensing is in addition to things like zoning. Um, so I think, I think including both that and the local licensing, I think, is a, is a really worthwhile thing to consider doing. Another thing I would like us to consider including in the host community agreement is since some places have already started having community outreach meetings, even well in advance of doing anything further, I think any feed, it would, I think it would be good if they said when they came to you to sign the HCA, this is the feedback we got at our community outreach meeting. This is how we're addressing it. Otherwise, the, you know, the community outreach meeting, which is purely a dog and pony show at this point, having been to two of them, um, if not, there's anything wrong with dogs and ponies, but is that I think it would be a valuable thing for the person signing the host community agreement to say, what did you hear? Did, you hear, did anybody come? I mean, you know, were there three people there and were they really concerned about odor, about a security camera, about something like that? And it may not be, it may just be something completely off in left field, but it may well be something because otherwise I don't see absolutely any connection between the community outreach meeting mm -hmm. and the entire rest of the process, except check, we did the process. So I think that would be a valuable thing. And it would also show the community there's a point in right. showing up to these community outreach right. meetings because it would get back to the town manager. Managers should not have to send staff to every single one of those to see what they're saying. I think some of that burden should be on the person running the meeting. And if I could make one other statement associated with the bottom part of this memo that talks about whether or not this is allowed by the transition provisions <coughs> in terms of local licensing. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, since I'm not an attorney like Mr. Kravitz is, um, no, I totally disagree with the assumption here that this could, of course, anything could be argued. I would similarly argue that we shouldn't have done the zoning for, for marijuana then because, hey, we could have just gone ahead and let the building commissioner decide where to put everything. But we chose not right. to do that because we thought it was not something that would frustrate the purpose because of the timing of this new industry. So I would argue that a local licensing process does not frustrate the charter at all because of the timing of the situation. However, hearing that everybody's <laughs> taking a really long time to get done with their process gives us more time. So hey, yay, we win anyway. But I, I just can't agree that that's a justification for not doing the local licensing process. The fact that we don't have time and we don't have bodies to do it is, is a justification. But similarly, coming back to something Mr. Bachman mentioned, and I want to make really clear, especially people who write editorials, is this town is not dragging its feet on HCAs. We have never drug our feet on HCAs. We are just trying to figure it out. There are other municipalities who are specifically misusing the process. They didn't get a moratorium established, and they're just dragging their feet on HCAs. We are not doing that. We are just trying to figure out safe and deliberate implementation. And so I'm really offended when people say that we're doing that because we are working really hard to figure this out to make it work for everybody. Right. Just to weigh in, I think um, it is desirable to have a local licensing process, but I agree that we want to work on getting the host community agreement piece set. Um, I totally disagree with what this memo tries to allege about not appropriate during the transition, and it could make the arguments the other way. So I think we don't really need that to be addressed here because my understanding that is the sole purview of the select board it to is. decide. So this it, kind of went over, and, and you know it's great to take initiative and kind of give an opinion. But I I, um, I think I could make the argument for why it's necessary and essential. Not as necessary and essential as dealing with the host community agreement. I expect that we'll get something partly teed up that will then be taken over by the council, but that it's really more about resources and staff time, and that's a manager's decision about how do we deal with licensing. It's quite desirable to have it for the enforcement reasons mentioned. It's a whole other thing, again, to figure out and work with council on. So the timing by itself is going to take a while, and that's a reason to wait. But um, I think it's absolutely in our purview to go ahead. If we had those resources, say we had someone give us a million dollar grant, we could just hire someone to just work on licensing, and then we'd have it in two months or whatever. Um, I think it is appropriate during the transition because, to me, necessary and essential means 
better government and making sure that we're doing things properly. And I think that the licensing is part of doing this properly. And so I think it's our obligation to proceed. But there's some practical reasons why it's going to have to be backburnered a little bit. But I don't just disagree with that. Mr. Can I ask two clarifying questions? It sounds like there was a policy recommendation to have a community outreach meeting before coming to talk to the town manager about a host community agreement that's not required by the state regulations that mm. no yeah if i could answer yeah. if they've done it which at least Thank one you. place is two places have done before they've come and asked for the hca mm -hmm. then if they do it in that order then it makes sense, mm -hmm. which is something that's easy for them to schedule in comparison to all the other pieces of the application process. So in that case, but no, absolutely, we couldn't mandate that it happen in that order if for whatever reason they choose not to do it in that order. But then the town manager could still say, so you're going to tell me about the what you're doing with the host? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then a second question for Mr. Steinberg about the police enforcement. Um, Specifically, is that you know um, allowing underage? You you want local police officers to be able to enforce if there's underage people who are being um, sold to, or if they're um, violating the their odor plan. Or um, I'm just trying to think of examples of of police enforcement, or or of the violation of a host community agreement or a special permit condition, or. Yep. I think you've given the most obvious examples in underage sales um, or inappropriate um, screening in any event um, would be um, the kinds of violations that we would want to um, have a assurance that we have some ability to enforce. And uh, I'm not sure that I want to try tonight and what's becoming too, too long a discussion probably already to have that dis, um, discussion um, I do appreciate however us having this because if there are some businesses including um, the medical marijuana establishments that have an interest in talking about the host community agreements and I don't know that it's um, helpful to the community in any of way to unduly delay that process and so I um, which is why I don't want to push the licensing thing too fast don't want to lose it but I don't want to put it before letting businesses go forward and um, get to the CCC and get in line and get moving so I think um, what I would suggest at this point because we've spent about an hour on this which is fine I think it's appropriate for us to do that and I think we're doing it properly by doing it in public session so it requires us to sort of think about things and discuss them and rethink about things on the fly which is is as our last meeting had the same sort of process we're going to probably do this another time in some ways but my takeaways from tonight relative to this is that there are a number of things that you've articulated relative to host community agreements and things that should be included that we've you know I think been affirmative about I think there's some the, the idea of a re, you know request for proposal is is got some traction whether it's one or more than one that you would potentially sign out of that I think we probably have some more thinking about and some and and it may depend on what what you get it may mm -hmm. be that uh, there's only one that rises or there may be three that rise to a particular location uh, that's allowable by zoning so we may have to visit that when we get to that point I'm not sure um, but I think you've gotten some feedback from us on on you know uh, things that we value and that, that our community values around the social justice issue and and other things of that sort that that want to be factors as well as you know s you know some business viability questions that we want to at least on some surface level have an understanding of um, but not completely have that be the only factor mm -hmm. and and it gets. Mm -hmm. We don't ask some of those questions like uh, has been brought up for other kinds of business. We don't ask some of those viability questions. Um, when we do it around affordable housing, it often has to do with, you know, the complexity of the financing that goes into those kind of things. So we do ask those questions. But I think in this case, it's hard to do that. But, but, um, but there are things we do want to try to encourage uh, that may not have in the, in the list here of, of uh, economic development or location or uh, those kind of things that, that 
that could be part and parcel of that. Um, are there other things we've mentioned that we should sort of articulate as some up points that, yes? Well, I mean, following up on both the enforcement piece and the local licensing piece in terms of whether or not those can reasonably, you know, we're charting new ground, but um, be included in the HCA, and if, and if so or if not, that might influence the length of the HCA, given that. Um, and to be clear, when we're talking about the economic viability, I mean, this is a really gray area, and there are clearly differences of opinion between us. I was frustrated previously when one of us was concerned about whether or not someone was legally a nonprofit, which I felt was really not our purview. I can see restauranteurs come before us who clearly are just, as we say, going to be closed <laughs> in six months. And in fact, although there's not the kind of limitation that there is on this one spot for a retail location, there are a limited number of places you can open a restaurant in Amherst. And yeah, so if we waste a common Vic and waste the uh, permitting process on someone who clearly doesn't know what they're doing, that's too bad, but you know, it sorts. I appreciate though, on the other hand, if, if we're trying really hard to be sensitive to the social equity issues, particularly if we get some guidance, I mean, hopefully they say they're gonna do it soon, to municipalities about how they think we might include it, um, I think that would be really helpful rather than necessarily expecting it to look like some of the really well put together packages that we've seen from people who are much more experienced in this area because I think we have made clear that we are not just interested in who's gonna give us the most money. We are interested in the social equity provision as well and I believe that's part of our community value associated with that. And I would also just wanna make sure before we end this conversation that we give some direction to the town manager associated with all the things that aren't retail in terms of really moving forward on that as well because if we have one of the few testing lab applications in the pipeline in Amherst versus the entire rest of the state, I'd love us to be early on in that. Sure. That'd be something that would be a great thing for us to be, or if there's uh, some, I don't think the co-ops are ready yet, but something right. else like that. I think that we, we'd be doing a service to the entire Commonwealth if we could suggest making progress on right. the non-retail. Right, aspects. and my opinion about that is that, you know, Given the area in which those businesses operate, you know, they're not direct to the public at large. They're a business to business business. Yep. Um, that makes Three sense. businesses, that's right. Um, I, I think there are some things about benefits and economic development and location and a little bit of public education, but since they aren't dealing with the public at large, I think there's, there's some need because they may want to articulate, well, this you know, we're bringing this near your neighborhood, by the way, this is what's gonna happen and here's what's going on. The public education aspect of that's a much different animal, but I do think we should move forward on on those things um, if, if, you know, available. And so that might come to us first because there may be something there that we can really move ahead with on that. Um, but but I, I think the retail is such a delicate one to, to contend with. I think that's why we spent so much time on it. I'm aware that we have some senior staff here who sat through our meanderings of this conversation, and I wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to hear their wisdom. I think they're, they were here as part of this issue. Right. So since they are here, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Brestrup, would you like to share some thoughts with us about this as well? Good evening. Chris Brestrup, Planning Director. I just have a few technical um, things I wanted to point out. One is that the map that was included with the uh, planning board report to town meeting is not a surveyed map. This is a map of the downtown area where we in the planning department um, made an effort to show um, some of the um, uh, buffer zones around various uses, particularly residential uses, but also the high school but we didn't survey anything. This is based on the GIS ma uh, plan that we have online, and it's based on very rough um, calculations as to what the distances are. So there may in fact be places in the downtown area, aside from the, the specific location that you've been discussing tonight, that could actually um, house a, a retail um, facility. So I just that was the first thing I wanted to point out. The second thing I wanted to point out is that I think that the reference to um, 
blueprints and um, you know site plans and things like that in the suggested uh, host community or agreement requirements is not really as onerous as um, you might think it is. Uh, we're not talking about having engineering drawings. We're talking about you know perhaps having a, a GIS map and showing you know where is the building located and where are the entrances and exits and what exact portion of the building are you thinking of using and is there um, access to uh, have people drop things off there, deliver things, et cetera. So it's really more of a conceptual um, plan to show that the location that the particular person or business is trying to um, achieve is doable. It's not, it's, it's kind of a reality check. And I think that the town manager would probably want to see um, some sort of plan to show there is a building there or there isn't. Is there parking there? Um, is it possible to access the site from a roadway? Um, just those very practical things. And I think those could be done in a conceptual manner. So I, I don't think you should think of this as a requirement for um, a whole set of engineering drawings. Perhaps the word blueprints might have thrown you off, um, but it, this can possibly Although be eight described. eight and a half by 11, I'm sure <laughs> it doesn't matter. The <laughs> useful this says. is. So, exactly, it should be Large, larger is big better. enough to read, but it doesn't have to be done by an engineer. So those are the only things I wanted to share with you. Great, thank you for that, I appreciate that. I appreciate you bringing up the, the point of the maps that we're at town meeting, because I think people will use those as a reference and we, we don't want people to lean too heavily on those because they were uh, to give a, an idea of, not a specific, here's the border period kind of thing. Um, Mr. Moore, did you have anything you wanted to offer to us at all about this? Um, Mr. Slaughter. Yes. Um, I'm reminded by what Ms. Brestrup said that I, I wanted to make one other thing clear, and it reflects something Ms. Kruger brought up oh, hours ago on page three when we were talking about the internal review team. I just want to be clear that while, yes, as always, I am saying very clearly, as I always have, that it is entirely within the town manager's purview to do the HCA. It is entirely within his purview to decide who he's going to talk to, and we're very grateful that he has worked with the select board up to this point. I will also say that with this process, as it's established, you are letting staff decide, not appointed officials, not elected officials, if somebody meets the bar to get in. That I find unacceptable. And we've had planning staff who did that decades ago that I do not think it's appropriate for staff to tell people whether or not they are going to be able to go through our process. I think it's good to give them realistic expectations. And I think that's why these guidelines are really helpful, whatever format they end up in. But I absolutely object to the idea that staff would be able to say no to a business that was considering coming here with out some appointed or elected officials associated with that, which is like, for example, the CBA. So I just don't want anybody to think that they're gonna get, even though we have amazing staff, that they're gonna get held up at that point in the process. Completely separate of that, I also just wanna make sure that I'm clear, I don't believe we're getting anything back about an HCA for an independent testing lab or cultivator or product manufacturers at this point, I'm believing that we're directing the town manager to move forward with whatever he needs to do that, given all the things we've talked about tonight. I, and he's got this whole separate process with retail that we're talking about. But for that, I'm not seeing that it's coming back to us except to say, yay, it happened when it happens. Uh, that's my sense of the board. Okay. The consensus of the board is that for those establishments, I think we've articulated yep. enough Yep. Uh, guidance for you hopefully that you can move ahead on that I certainly see that and, I, and mm -hmm. actually that segues nicely to my next point which is as we move ahead how do we want to from an agenda standpoint and thinking about host community agreements do we want to uh, approach this topic do we want the manager to go and do some work which some length of time it's appropriate and come back to us with something or do we want to uh, just go with tonight's guidance and send him off to swim or on his own or, or you know in the deep end um, or do we want to or do we want to come back with sort of one more kind of we write a memo with all right so given the conversations we've had the last two meetings here's the sort of bullet points of what I'm looking at and how I'm judging these things I mean it's obviously not going to be a pointed plan and I, and I don't want to create work for you in that regard but I also I want to sense the board as far as their comfort level at this point 
with do we need to discuss this another time or do we want to let the manager move ahead on most community agreements for retail with what we've discussed so far? I, I'm thinking of a sort of hybrid because I don't, I mean, just, I'm getting, we, we, we're going to rehash and rehash and we're not going to, we only have so many meetings this summer. I'm willing to let the manager and the staff um, who participated tonight go ahead and try something and give us updates on how that's going rather than coming back and saying, well, like, you know, here's my plan. What do you think of it? Implement, sort of mush together everything that we've said, do your best, and then give us updates about where you are in the process, which is a little different than us having to have this conversation again. I'm perfectly fine with that personally as well. And, and if there are particular points that come up as you start to sort of make your personal list of to do's with regard to any host community agreement, you know, if there's questions for us, then obviously we can come back and discuss those. If something new arises mm -hmm. in the conversations, if something, you know, if something one of the potential uh, mm -hmm. businesses brings up, you're like, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of that. Maybe, you know, if you want our feedback, certainly that's mm -hmm. a possibility to be added to our agenda as well. But I would like us to, in terms of agenda setting, and I know sometimes we just talk about things under town manager's report, which is totally fine, but again not something to bring back to us to say take another cut at this which thing which hyphen can you change in at this time Ms. Brewer <laughs> um, no that's not what I'm looking for but I do think given the urgency of the independent testing lab and given the urgency of the retail location down locations possibly downtown I think we'll want to have an update simply that we're being that we're able to make some kind of progress within the next four weeks or so just to say this is how far we got mm -hmm. like right. we're still waiting on town council to tell us this mm -hmm. that or the other thing or it turns out rfps are complicated for this reason or whatever and the independent testing lab wasn't actually ready or it is ready or but some sort of update i would think within a month would be reasonable but that doesn't mean it has to be in writing it's just mm -hmm. telling us what's going on do you have anything to offer in no i um uh, agree that uh Town manager should move forward and consult as he feels appropriate. Um, I agree with the guidance that's been offered. Is a month an okay time frame? Given what uh, you know I what's I in think the I'd give you an update every meeting to see our, mm -hmm. know where right. we are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll take more information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know that about us. Yeah. That's great. Is, all right. So I think, fortunately, we've kind of gotten ourselves to a place where I think we've got some understanding of each other's point of view and, and tried to articulate some things for the manager and so hopefully that'll be helpful to him. He's not further flummoxed by our <laughs> wandering. All right, so we'll move on to our next agenda item which is intermunicipal agreements and renewals. And we also have, we have a memo from you on that so if you want to introduce yes, that. Yes, so uh, it's a requirement that the select board approve intermunicipal inter agreements. By far, the, most of these are thing, are agreements that are held between the town and neighboring communities. Um, for instance, mutual aid. We have mutual aid agreements with practically every community in Hampshire County. Um, if you could just yeah. so I'd like to thank the staff that have come, Jeff and and thank Rob Mora and Chris. I'm sorry you guys are out the door, but thank you for coming and staying and being patient with us. Yep. Sorry, that's fine. So um, we provide ambulance services to the towns of Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury. We have intercept, paramedic intercept services uh, agreements with the city of Northampton. A new one would be a paramedic intercept service with the town of Hadley. That would mirror what we already have with the town of Northampton because they've gone off on their own. Paramedic intercept service means that we have an agreement that if a, a basic life support ambulance is moving and we need to transfer over to paramedics, we can have a paramedic get on board. Uh, things like that. Um, there is, we, we, as you know, we serve our veteran services with multiple communities. Uh, we utilize uh, services uh, for sealer of weights and measures with the city of Northampton. Uh, there's one on there we don't do anymore, which is the municipal hearing officer with the city of Northampton. There's some that we gathered that I found out after the fact that we don't have those agreements anymore. Uh, we provide our dog kennel services to the city of Northampton on an overflow basis. There's a new one that we are just beginning to have conversations with um, in the South Deerfield Water District about our professional staff providing support on a contracted basis to their um, water district. You might have read some things in the paper. That's, there's nothing in writing, nothing, in, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Uh, so the, it's a renewal of all of the um, uh, municipal, um, intermunicipal agreements, except for 
the paramedic intercept service with the town of Hadley and the mutual aid agreement with the town of Hadley. So I move to authorize the town manager to enter into the intermunicipal agreements as outlined on the memorandum from the town manager to the select board as amended by his report for the authorization of intermunicipal agreements dated July. Actually put that additional after at the end for the authorization of intermunicipal agreements dated July 6, 2018. So that um, the one change you did note gets uh, picked up into the motion. Is there a second? I, I will second, but I want to ask to amend. So I know Go we ahead. don't follow Robert's rules, so how are you? Um, so a couple of things. I want to include the Mass General Law reference, and I don't care where it is, but it needs to be in there. It's as shown very helpfully on the memo. It's Chapter 40, Section 4A. This is not a nice to do. This is a required to do, and it's an authorization, not an approval, and that word is in their authorization, but to to authorize town manager under or whatever, mm -hmm. wherever you want to put it. My other concern is I want it to be perfectly clear in the minutes. It doesn't have to be part of the motion. That, I think, should be part of the motion. It doesn't have to be perfect. The minutes need to reflect the fact that we are authorizing something we haven't seen. I do not believe that's what Mass General Law is asking us to do. I am willing to do that. But I don't believe Mass General Law is asking us to authorize agreements we haven't seen. I don't believe that's a plain English reading of the authorization. I also am not saying I want to read all of these. <laughs> and I know that some of them are rollovers and they're just like, ja, da, 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 we do it over and over again. It's authorized to sign, but why would I authorize someone to sign something? I mean, okay, let's be practical. Why would I authorize someone to sign something if I didn't want to sign? Here's your blank check. Thank you. Um, no, that's so I want to make sure that the minutes reflect that we are authorizing documents we have not reviewed. So you can think of a clever way to put that, but I don't want anybody to think we know what those things say. Ms. Kerr. I, I don't want to read them, but would it be at it? adequate to say they were publicly available for review? Are they? We, we could, I don't know, but wouldn't they They're be under, documents. under, yeah, under, our, but, you know, transparent. But, but what so is, we're, should, they're, they're available, and I, I hear your point, and I'm not disagreeing with it, but as part of that to just say they, in having the minister, that, that these are available on the town website for review by us and by the public. I know we're already authorizing them to do it, so what's the point? But um, so to follow up, to be clear, normally the list of documents includes documents we've seen. It does. The list of documents isn't I, going to include this. I understand. They're not all in one place on the website, so they're all something that people would have to go and request. And I really hope that for staff's sake, they don't go and request them all. But um, I just want to be clear that we're authorizing documents we have not read. We are assuming that it, they are entirely appropriate to sign. And yes, public, please go read them at your leisure. Um, you can but I would normally not vote to authorize an agreement that I haven't read. If it was the strategic partnership agreement, would we feel the same way? I don't no. think so. So that's still an authorization as well. So let's just have the minutes say something helpful. Is it for the discussion? It is intermunicipal hyphenated or not? Because it is on the agenda, but not on the motion. And I believe it's intermunicipal agreement, capital A. So we just to be consistent, the motion and the minute and the and the agenda don't match. Golly, I don't think it's hyphenated in the law. I don't See, think it is either. But it is on our it is on four C. So we know, and I think it would be I, another just. Yes. Are we talking about authorizing the signing of intermunicipal agreements that are renewals, where if something is new that we has never 
come to us before, we're also authorizing that, or is this just the ones we've always done and we're allowing you to renew them without having to bring each well, one in? I think as I reported when you were out of the room, these are all renewals except for the intermunicipal agreement for paramedic intercept services with the town of Hadley and the mutual aid agreement with the but, town of Hadley. So Hadley's new, but that type of agreement we've potentially Identical. could have seen before because, so, I'm comfortable with this because they're renewals or adding another town to agreements we've had previously with different municipalities. It's, this is not a carte blanche. Go enter into any municipal intermunicipal agreement no, you want. It's ones. those that we've already had, plus adding Hadley to the same form we've used for the other communities. If we're going to say just because the renewals doesn't mean the renewals on the same terms. The terms could be completely I, different. That may be true, but I'm but I'm just saying that's different than saying any intermunicipal agreement you want, don't show it to us, fine. We're talking about ones we have, and yes, it could change, but there's sort of in a defined universe of things that we usually do. Mr. Seinberg? Uh, no comment. If I was going to do anything, I'd call the question. <laughs> okay. Are we ready to vote? So, is there further discussion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. And we have one absent as well. So that's three to one with one absent. All right. Next is uh, charter transition update topics for future council consideration. Do we have anything in that area of transition? So as you know, the governor has signed the legislation that allows for the um, election to go forward on September 4th and November 6th. Uh, that's the last um, action that needed to be taken for the transition to complete itself and for the election to be held accordingly. Um, so everything's in place for that. The, um, I think that's, that's the major thing that, that has happened. The, you have later in your agenda, the bylaw review committee. Um, one other thing I did want to mention is that, um, I've invited all council candidates to a, information session on Wednesday night um, to um, I, to meet with department heads and we would make a the department heads will be making a presentation to all the council candidates in an effort to um, make everybody make sure everyone who is a council candidate has a, a base level of information about the town and also to open the door for for some um, communication between me and the council candidates uh, but also to sort of set some expectations for what um, council candidates should expect from town staff. Uh, we've already had some council candidates um, reaching out directly to town staff coming to meetings or inviting them to meetings and town staff are asking, what should I do? I want to sort of communicate what our expectations are that we want to communicate. We want to be per, um, willing to um, work with anybody who is a council candidate, but if our DPW director has to spend an hour with every council candidate. That's a 35, 34 hours of work a week. Then we lose a week of his time. So we want to sort of manage that and share information in as efficient a way as possible on that. It also is, it gives us an opportunity to talk to the council candidates about um, what the uh, campaign finance and reporting requirements are. So the town clerk and our future town clerk will be here as well. Uh, we'll be able to c convey some key points to them. And also, just I know it's been an issue for us in the past. Um, we're starting to see a proliferation of signs in the public way, communicate to all the council candidates at the same time about what the expectations are. So there are no surprises to the council candidates as they start to put their signs out. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of like the town hall roadshow, which we've done in the past. Um, but, and probably it's nothing, you would probably not learn anything, but I also, I felt it was important for the council candidates to put a name with a face for some of our department heads. So that was the, the goal of it. It's a time limited um, evening, uh, but also just a, an attempt to say, you are, out of this 34, there's gonna be 13 people who are gonna be 
the leaders of the town in terms of the council. So we want to sort of recognize that up front that, that this is a very important election for the mm -hmm. town. If I could just follow up on that, I was hoping you were going to bring that vendor charter transition because that totally qualifies under that topic. But I also want to emphasize to the public that select board members don't get an hour of the DPW's time, have not gotten an hour of the DPW director's <laughs> time, except when he's sitting out there in the audience for everyone to see, ever. So it is entirely inappropriate for candidates or previously town meeting members to expect that from staff. So I really appreciate that you've been able to figure out a roadshow approach to it that should work for people. And then if people do want to ask, then I'm sure you'll tell them that they can go to you and they can say, can I please, please talk to the assessor for 50 minutes about some other thing? And then you can deal with that. But our staff is so generous with their time that I feel like they're sometimes taken advantage of. And so I appreciate that, that you're going to set the ground rules for that. And yet at the same time, give everybody a really good introduction that they may have never had, especially if they've not been town meeting members. So that sounds great. Are there any other updates, topics that you know of or that my colleagues know of or need to inform us of relative to charter transition? No. With the nomination papers closed last, well. On the June 29th. June 29th, that all went. Yes, all went, went really well. There's a issue. list. That was the other thing you should say. You made a list. Go right ahead. Staff made a list. Um, that's readily available right there. You can just find it in the banner so that anybody can go and look. They don't have to worry about how people's names are spelled or whatever. Figure it out. Write it down. They made a, they made a nice list for everybody. Right. So just so the, t the staff is working on a lot of different things. For instance, um, you know we're having conversations about how to archive the town meeting. That stuff still that the, the actions of town meeting are still legitimate. We have to have a place where they, people can find the information. But we also have to reflect that the new form of government is the council that won't flip over until December 3rd but we are working on that kind of material so it's ready to go on the date of the switch over to the council in the meantime we will keep the town meeting but we have a plan for archiving that information um, on the website so as people can still I mean we still are looking up actions from town meeting on different on a daily basis so it's it's a really valuable place to have that and there's um, you know the other thing is you know we're talking about things to do in this room um, in terms of how to accommodate a 13-member council um, and other things in town hall. So it's an ongoing process. Many staff members are involved, and um, you know, we'll be talking with other folks as well as we move forward on this. And if there aren't any others on that item, then I think we'll move down to our section under committee boards appointments and reappointments. We have some things there. Um, so we have the agents of the select board. I was thinking about that. We, they're not secret agents because they're <laughs> listed here or special agents necessarily. They're just agents of the select board. And this is a, a routine item that we do and we have a memo, um, I believe to you from the, from the chief um, mm -hmm. relative to this. Um, did you want to introduce that at all before we do the motion on that? You just did. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a list of folks. Um, the purpose in chapter 138 section 63 of them being agents of the select board is to carry out your function i um see i put you on the spot because yeah. <laughs> i didn't look it up either <laughs> i think it's just that they can execute their their, their tasks so they, and mm -hmm. and uh We have this every year we should know it right right yeah, exactly it's probably it's because we only do it once a year so but I would entertain a motion while I move to <laughs> chapter one. I move to appoint the police officers as recommended by Chief of Police Scott Livingstone in a memo dated June 29, 2018, and approved by the town manager as agents of the select board in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 63, for an effective term of July 1, 2018 through June 30. 2019 is there a second second okay now i note that um goes it goes past the term of the select board and i assume but don't That's know that um the the um, council replaces the select board in this capacity and that they become um uh, agents but uh since we've, it, 
That's the only thing that's causes <coughs> pause about the wording. I wonder if we want to modify it to say, um, or or sooner if uh, law requires, because we don't know if under that section of Mass General Law what what it means if there's a council instead right. of a select board. Maybe so it may section. have to be reauthorized because it may be <coughs> a different clause. Yes. No. But that's the exact reason not to do this. We need to not do this with every single thing that happens. We need to not say, oh, we're approving a common VIC, but, you know, halfway through it actually belongs to the licensing commissioners. Like, we just have to go ahead and do things. And these things will sort themselves. Well, really, we'll be okay. Be pointed out to the bylaw committee, though. Right. This isn't the kind of so thing. this this is a, they enforce, as you, as the licensing mm -hmm. authority, they enforce actions under you. That's why you have to appoint them to right. act on so your behalf. Our agents. Because you're the licensing authority. They're your agents right. when things, when there's a liquor license violation right. or something so like that. So we'd be wrong to put counsel because they'll probably be agents of the new licensing commission. Yep. So that's why we just shouldn't touch it. <laughs> we should just leave it go. I, I'm not disagreeing with you, Alyssa, but I think it's worth at least considering we don't need agents after we dissolve in December. Somebody else needs agents. And so I don't know if this action going all the way to June 30th makes sense because if there are agents and we don't exist, what does that, what's the point? Yes. Uh, they're agents of the licensing authority. They're not agents of the select board. You are the. Agents you happen the to be the out licensing authority. authority at this moment in time. There will be a new licensing okay. authority uh, come de okay. December some point. Okay. So they're um, agents of that? Of the well, whoever the authority is All for right. that license. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Got it. All right. Carry over. Is there further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's uh, unanimous with one absent. Next is uh, status of extended committee board's terms. Um, do we have any update there as far as? Uh, the, the one person we have is um, the, the bylaw review committee. Okay, action. that's the only one. So in that regard, why don't we take that one up as well? So if you would like to make a motion relative to that. Yeah, I'm gonna move to appoint Ken Hargreaves to the bylaw review committee. Second. And uh, I think that's sufficient because it's He's going to serve until the committee um, dissolves, if we agree. Um, so let me explain what had happened, because uh, we've gone through, of course, quite a process, as um, I think the entire board knows, since uh, Ms. Moran indicated that she could not continue to serve and submitted a resignation. And uh, uh, Mr. Hargreaves, who's a former member, uh, um, and the th I'm not sure if he's still a current member, but I know he's been a member, a longtime member of town meeting from Precinct 2, and he's a current member of the Board of Assessors, was recommended to us for consideration by our principal assessor, and um, I've had several conversations with Mr. Hargreaves, um, and um, he then attended last week a meeting of the committee and I've spoken with Mr. Ritchie who is the chair of the committee both before and after the meeting with the committee and um, the second of those conversations um, the report was that um, uh, we think that he would be an excellent contributor to finish out what we're doing and um, they actually have taken steps already to adjust their work schedule and meeting schedule to coincide with his vacation plans. And if you follow the um, meeting notices and saw that they canceled some meetings and added some meetings, that was as a result of the follow-up mm -hmm. to this meeting. Um, and uh, the last thing that I wanted to just remind you all is that in November of 17, we appointed um, Mr. Hargreaves to the Board of Assessors after reviewing his Citizens Activity Form. Um, he did not, not, we did not request a new CAF because the information is basically the same as was provided on the prior CAF. So um, that's the background that um, I wanted to report to you in support of the motion that I've already made. 
I just want to follow up to say that I know a number of us did specifically recruit women to this seat, and we appreciate Mr. Grief serving, as well as the other two gentlemen who are already serving, but we did attempt very, very hard to make it not be all men of a relatively similar age, but that is just the way it turned out because they need to move forward and make progress. And that committee may well go through a transition after the council comes into play. They may make it larger. They may be bored with it. It's just, you know, there's future opportunities, but right now we just need to move. So I'm really glad he was able to attend the meeting and see that it was something he was interested in. I'll just add, um, I really appreciate my colleagues' efforts to recruit. This is hard. It's a very kind of particular um, job, and I think we found an excellent person, and especially just as Mr. Steinberg um, explained, the number of phone calls and the effort to kind of bring the forces together to make this happen. I'm, I'm really appreciating this. It's a very important group in terms of our responsibility in the transition. So I just think you guys did a great job. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous with one member absent. Mm -hmm. And then we move on to our licenses, public way and metered parking reservations in section seven. And so the first one of those is the first day celebration, road closure and parking reservation. We have a memo. Uh, from Mr. Morris to <coughs> Mr. Bachman and ourselves regarding this uh, particular event. So um, the one problem that I have with the motion on the motion sheet, and I'm gonna therefore make some amendment to it, is that it does not specify the parking spaces um, which are actually listed in the letter from uh, the Superintendent Morris to Mr. Bachman and the select board dated July 2. So, uh, and the time as well. I would uh, move to um, approve the road closures and parking reservations for the first day celebration hosted by the Amherst Regional Public Schools on the Town Common. August 28, 2018, as follows. The Spring Street parking lot adjacent to the Amherst Town Common and Boltwood Avenue from Spring Street to Route 9 from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Is there a second? Yes, now that we've added that information. <laughs> so we have a second. Is there further comment? Yes. We should also add a contact person. We should go ahead and put Debbie Westmoreland down as the contact. We should always have a contact person. We don't always have a manager, you know, like for an alcohol license, but we should have a contact person. In the motion? Yeah. At the end of the motion, it's like, who was in charge of that? So go dig in for a memo. Somewhere. Debbie Westmoreland, assistant to the superintendent, I think. So I will uh, comment that this. Well, probably not controversial. Um, it does involve schools, and so I will abstain in my vote. Um, it is under their purview. Um, and so, is there other, further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And Mr. Wall is absent, and I am abstaining. And so that's three to zero. Three to three zero one one. Three zero one one. So, so now we have two items on our consent calendar remaining. Yes. So I would uh, move to approve items B1 and B2 from the consent calendar for July 9, 2018 agenda as presented. Second. Is there further discussion? Ms. Brewer, you look like you have a comment. Oh, I'm just making sure that the consent calendar doesn't include the thing we already did. So it stops. No, he EIF. took it out. Yes. He was very careful and he took it out. Yes. Well, All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And one absent. And Mr. Wald. So now I believe we're to that town manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, um, 
alert you that you will start to be inundated with minutes in the coming <laughs> meetings because we're trying to get them all sequentially through the poor clerk who has to read them all. Uh, and now we have uh, Ms. Mills who's keeping us up to date um, and Ms. Puppel who's catching us up. So um, in the coming, your future meetings will always have, most likely have minutes on the agenda. So I apologize for that, but it's be good to get it done. Um, I want to mention that there is uh, another Cup of Joe happening on Friday, uh, July 13th at Kelly's Restaurant, and I'll be joined by Principal Assessor David Burgess. And just as a note, this is the 15th uh, Cup of Joe that we've had so far, and they've all been really good. Uh, along the same lines, I've been ha continuing to have uh, meetups with town employees. So far, we've had I've had 11 meetups, which have met uh, for an hour with 54 different employees uh, is in small groups, and those have all been really productive, and I think they go a long way in terms of building uh, camaraderie among the staff as well. Uh, a major, um, July 1 was a really major day in that it was the end of our fiscal year, beginning of our new fiscal year, but most importantly, it marked the termination of our um, participation in the, in the self-insured health trust. We are now a, in a fully insured product through Maya. Um, as you all know, the claims from prior months will still be filtered through the trust. Uh, there is a surcharge that's placed on employees' paychecks to pay for those claims. Um, but as of July 1, um, the uh, everybody has a new card. It's through Blue Cross. Uh, through, the, through the Maya Health Benefits Trust, and the, just a tremendous number of people did a, a great amount of work um, to make this transition because it was, it's not just the current employees, it's also retirees, and a lot of education went into it, and just uh, really, um, and, and with very few complaints, honestly, um, people don't like it, but they understand what, why we had to do it, and, I, and just, I think people, uh, that's a real, um, uh, um, credit to the staff who spent all the time with everybody to, and one-on-one -on -one conversations um, with, uh, because the staff sort of got it and then they were able to uh, disseminate that information out on a one-to-one -one basis without fellow staff members and with retirees so a major step forward on that and that gives us predictability for the coming year controlling our costs for health insurance for the coming two to three years um, and I think it, it puts us in a good shape in, in good shape for a, a very for a few years going forward and I think I mentioned last time that the uh, representatives from Penn State had come in the Penn State jet uh, to visit UMass and they had their our borough manager and and we and um, we had uh, in their public safety officials and we had our um, municipal officials as well so it was an interesting conversation that we had with them the um, Wayfinding signs, by the time we meet next, they should be installed. They're trying to have them in, um, well, hopefully within, well, maybe it won't be before we meet next, but by mid-August is their goal to have the signs. The sign uh, signs are physically in town. I have not seen them yet to make sure that it's what we expected to see. We are scheduled to go see them at some point uh, this week, and so those signs will be installed at the um, roundabout at Triangle and East Pleasant Street. Uh, you probably have seen the uh, sculptures that are in Kendrick Park. There's four of them in there. The official opening was on July 5th, last Thursday. Um, they didn't have a ceremony. They just said, we're open for business. And there were six other on UMass property. And uh, we've had one complaint when they first went in. There's a chimes on, um, what is that? is that? That's not Triangle Street at that point. That's... North Pleasant Street, whatever it is there. And on the corner of Kendrick yeah. Park? It's on the, yeah. North. North and so a, a person corner. across the way emailed me and said, this is not so good. And because um, <laughs> people are playing Shocker. at all times. And, <laughs> not like a little wind chime, you know. <laughs> right. But uh, the sponsors of it got right on it, met with the property owner, made some adjustments. They had a backup plan for if those adjustments didn't work, they, were, they had some other plans in place. And so that worked out really, really nicely. So I was happy that they were on it right away. Um, do that. Um, oh, we talked about uh, previously about uh, the problem of having um, 
a polling station at Crocker Farm, especially for the preliminary election, the, prim the state primary on September 4th, which happens to be the first day of pre-K, I think it is. Um, Ms. Mills used to be at Crocker Farm. She's well aware of this. Um, so we looked at alternate sites and uh, with the now retired town clerk and we're hesitant to relocate a polling location for this election uh, for two reasons. One, we couldn't find a suitable location that was near um, the Crocker Farm School and the only suitable location would have been uh, the Munson Library and that's not on a bus route and it just seemed like it would not be equitable to relocate something on that date. We have had conversations with the uh, principal and uh, the police department will have additional, st no, we, we will have a police officer on site, but we will also, um, the concern of the principal was traffic enforcement. So we will dedicate a police officer there for as long as the principal would like to help manage the traffic flow in and out at that busy time in the morning, especially. So we're gonna sort of manage that through as best we can and the principal and the superintendent are been very cooperative on this. Um, Another momentous day was uh, at the end of the fiscal year is when our contract with um, with Hadley for ambulance services expired. That happened on June 30th. They switched over on June 29th at 9.05. Um, so that has actually made it a, quite a significant difference in that they account for 20% of our uh, ambulance runs and 20% of the calls into our dispatch center. Both have been pretty, you know, as you found out from the fire staffing study report and has been evidenced to me from the dispatch center been, have created uh, the level of calls have been pretty high and creating uh, concern with our staff. Hopefully this will relieve some of that pressure um, and well, it's got to relieve us 20% fewer. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, the um, water supply, you may have read in the paper about um, East Hampton, North Hampton, South Hampton, all issuing water restrictions. Um, these restrictions are consistent with their water management permit. It's not necessarily due to scarcity in their water supply. They have in their permits when a, the Mill River in Northampton gets to a certain point, if it's below a certain point, they have to issue mandatory water restrictions. It doesn't even look at the fact how much water they have. Um, we are in a different, we have a different permit and we are in much better condition. So our average condition for cumulative rainfall is 22.1 inches. During that 2016 drought year, at the same moment in time on July 1, we had 15.1 inches. Today, on July 1, we had 24 inches of rain. So we have higher than average rainfall. The daily water demand is an average about 2.5 million gallons per day. Uh, in that 2016 drought conditions is 3.4 million gallons per day. And then today on July 1, we were still, we went, we're back to 2.5 million gallons per day. So there was a giant uptick in water usage during that 2016 drought conditions. And as we look at Atkins Reservoir, um, its average condition is 1.1 feet below its maximum level. During the drought conditions, it was 3.4 feet below its maximum level. And today it's overflowing, it's at 0, 0.0. Uh, we're not even pulling water from Atkins Reservoir at this point. So we have plenty of water at this point. We'll continue to monitor it. Um, the driving force is always rain and um, water usage. And if we see any change in water usage, we note it. Um, one way we've identified that is, um, is, is water being drawn down uh, at UMass that they noticed there was a water break in one of their dormitories that somebody had had installed something that just in the water line burst and our tank started going down. It didn't get to dangerous levels, but it didn't, so it didn't set off alarms. So but people noticed the sudden drop in the tank. So it was really, um, people, are, the staff are paying close attention to those things. Um, so what else? Uh, you should be expecting to see a lot of paving coming forward. Um, the Amherst Woods work continues. The major roads that will be paved this year are East Pleasant Street between Clark Hill Road and Eastman Lane, Southeast Street between Colonial Village and Middle Street, Main Street between Boltwood Avenue and Dickinson Street, North Pleasant Street between North Village Drive and Fisher Street, 
West Bay Road between Goldway and Spencer Drive, Webster Street between Main Street and Spring Street, Churchill Street between Main Street and Spring Street, those are two little streets, Coles Lane, which is the one downtown between North uh, Pleasant Street and North Prospect Street, and then South Prospect Street between Amity Street and Gaylord Street. So those are the major um, road projects that we're funding through our um, pavement money that we have this year. Those are all being contracted out. Uh, when they get paved, they'd also include sidewalk work and aff uh, affiliated sidewalk work uh, along as, as the um, engineers have designed it. Question on that. So we're already into July. Yep. It's a big list and um, are we gonna are we gonna get them? I mean, I'm a little concerned because none of them have really started yet. Uh, right. So we've got a real backlog, and what always happens is we go right into school starts, and we're scrambling before the asphalt plants close. And it sounds like we're gonna be right up against. Right. We couldn't sign any contracts till July one. This is all right. FY19 money, okay. but we're probably going to be in the same boat because there's a lot of paving. Uh, um, demand out there and there aren't in many companies out there who do it at the level that we want it to be done so just start a municipal paving company <laughs> yeah, well yeah, or marijuana whatever you want right. um, <laughs> I, we, can't, we, can't, can't mix those i don't yeah. think <laughs> the streets with the, the residues or yeah whatever. i do want to notify you that we received a notice of non-compliance for violation of our air quality permit for the landfill uh, apparently the landfill gas had been rooted to the gas flare um, and, but the flare didn't ignite. And so uh, when that came to, the, and we had to report that to DEP, they have penalized us in the sense that they I've, will be signing a administrative consent order. There is not a penalty, a financial penalty in, uh, involved. We do, we're gonna make an improvements to the flare and the flare can't be operated without someone there watching it. Our system is not, is one that where the, the gas builds up relatively slowly so we can do it on a manual basis. Um, so there, if there were to be fines, if we fail to comply with the new system, then we'll be subject to fines. The manager's out there with one of those barbecue lighters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just an interesting note, uh, when we were talking at one point, we, um, the economic development director sort of counted up how many residential development units we have been permanent since 2015, and the town has built 500 residential mm -hmm. dwelling units. Uh, these include Olympia Place, One East Pleasant Street, uh, Spring Street, which is going forward, North Square at the Mill District. If you count you know, University Drive that's coming forward, Presidential Apartments, and Kendrick Place. Um, and then there's 162 that are still in the permitting stage, which includes uh, a relatively new proposal on, on Southeast Street and uh, at the Amherst Motel site. One other thing I wanted to alert you to is that there is a proposal coming forward to the Design Review Board, I think it's the Design Review Board, uh, this month probably for the Bertucci site, um, which would encompass a new construction, um, the way I understand it, I haven't seen anything, uh, but a, a building of significant, uh, similar height to what its neighboring buildings are. Uh, and then it'd be a two-stage thing, one for the Bertucci site and one for the where the spoke is. So there'll be some development down at that area where people are looking to uh, leverage the um, low density of that property. And uh, so we will see more about that when they come to design review in a couple weeks. Um, we had tagged this Berkshire gas uh, rate change as something to pay attention to. And last time I thought it was June 11th, but it wasn't, it's July 11th and Greenfield is their public hearing. We have written to some people about this um, wondering why they're getting a rate height increase hike when they're not providing more gas and we it's the lack of gas is the uh, moratorium on gas is really hurting our businesses um let's see i'm not sure we had a debrief meeting with craig's doors um interesting that uh the, We've instituted a meeting with the staff and the trustees of Craig's Doors, which has been really beneficial, I think. Um, staff has been pretty stable over the last two years, which has really helped, according to our public safety officials. They had 172 guests stay at the shelter, 131 were men and 41 women. 18% uh, were under 25 years of age, and 47% were older than 50. 
and 22 percent re reported to be of Latino descent, and this is information that they typically gather on their guests. Um, the issue for them is always funding, and going forward, they're looking at uh, securing more stable uh, funding, and also next year they will need to renew their permit through the State Building Commission. Um, I'm not sure, I know some board members went to the Independence Day fireworks um, held at McGurk, outside McGurk Stadium. Tremendous organizational effort, and it's, it's gotten bigger over, over time by our LSSC staff. They put a lot of effort in, and we really want to thank the University of Massachusetts um, for being so cooperative. They provide all kinds of physical plant support and um, public safety support. Um, it's one of those things that they do for the town and for the whole region that doesn't get recognized very often, but we always recognize it um, ourselves. But um, it is a nice gesture on their part um, for our communities, because people really like the fireworks. We have to get lots of people there, even if you wind up coughing your way out of it, as some people <laughs> did. Um, the, uh, the chair spoke at two Valley bike launches on June 29th, uh, one in Northampton and one here. We had one in, in here, which was uh, really incredible because uh, Ms. Brewer and Mr. Slaughter met with some middle school students who had come up with the idea of having a, a bike share. And then not a month later, they were cutting the ribbon to announce the, the uh, Valley bike share. It was really a, a terrific event. Um, we are... In terms of the dog park, we're, we are expecting positive news on a grant application to the Stanton Foundation for design money. And if we get that design money, uh, then we, once we get the design completed, which we sort of have a rendering of it already, we will be seeking additional funds uh, for construction. So that's all going uh, according to the, we, the plan we had hoped. And so that's it's really... Um, really good thing and I really do have to give a tribute to Dave Zomack our assistant town manager who um, when they read the proposal and reviewed it said it was one of the best proposals they'd ever seen come in for and most developed most thought out most comprehensive most community involvement uh, very impressed by the whole process so uh, Mr. Pistrang and Mr. Zomack deserve a lot of credit for that um, let's see I would want to mention that uh, credit to the finance department for we and they closed out they're closing out the FY18 fiscal year and launching the FY19 where that's where in that one period where you have to decide where you're going to pay your bills which is comes still a FY18 bill or FY19 bill uh, they're moving forward the finance committee had its final meeting last Thursday I think it was um, they voted for the FY18 budget they voted to transfer funds out to cover the snow and ice deficit which is typically what happens. We, they hold on to it until they know they don't use it. They also transferred uh, funds um, to cover any kind of expenses we're going to have without fitting this room. They saw that, they, they understood purposely that we did not budget for that this year because in not knowing what the outcome of the election was going to be. Uh, so they've transferred funds uh, into the town hall budget in order for us to take the steps necessary to create a space for the council to meet. And they were comfortable with that. Um, and so, and then the, the last thing is just we, on June 20th, we had our employee, town employee picnic. Um, and it was the biggest turnout we've ever had. And at least that's what people tell me, I've only gone twice, but, um, but it, it was really a, a terrific event. We had our new wellness people from Maya there giving back massages and chair massages. Um, and there is a, um, so it, the people, it's all organized by employees. It's funds donated by employees to put it on. It's one, one day where everybody comes together. We had a great turnout from DPW and from, uh, we had good representation from fire and police and all town hall and LSSC and even in library employees all are able to come together and sort of circulate with each other. Um, Carol Hepburn is the master chef um, cooking up the, the things in the, uh, the grill. Um, and this year, um, next year, the DPW, they figured out that they have enough um, people who play musical instruments where they can have a band coming out of DPW. So they're gonna practice so they can perform next, at next year's picnic. 
and they quickly came up with their their name of their band. It's going to be called Municipal Waste. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a really terrific thing. Um, on your desks are some of the Crosstown contemporary art thing. So this is their their handout that they're they're putting together with that. And um, that's all I have to report tonight. Any questions for the manager? Any additional questions? Yes. Yes. So way back on page four, mm -hmm. um, as you had mentioned to us before, the building commissioner issued a notice of dangerous structure to the owner of 159 North Pleasant Street, which instructed the owner to demolish the structure yep. the owner has, blah, blah, blah. I know you know what you wrote. I'm just reading it for everyone else's benefit. Is that so many pages? Um, is been in touch, has been in communication with building commissioner, secured the site, and is actively seeking options for the site. I just want to put it out there that he, the owner, didn't put up the fence as quickly as the building commissioner asked, and the owner hasn't done the demolition yet, which was requested to be done months ago. And I'm trying to understand how this sets a precedent for other property owners in town when. It was really difficult to get in touch with this person in the first place, and now they're not following the rules, and they could be fined a thousand dollars a day for this. And I appreciate that our building—I do appreciate their building commissioners working with them, but it gets to a point where it's like everybody else says, "So why do I follow the rules?" Um, I, I just—I'm trying to understand. So I, I'd I check into that. That'd be great. Other questions for the manager? If not, then we'll go to select board member reports. Does anyone have a report? Anyone been in any meetings? I have a housing trust meeting later this week, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't at any meetings last week because I was out of town, so that rules out me. Anyone else have any other news or notes to share? I'm going to, I'll put it on hold to see if you talk about it during your report. It's about the town manager evaluation. Uh, yes, thank you for reminding me. Um, so the uh, town, manager, town manager evaluation is uh, currently in the phase where we're soliciting uh, comment from the public, town meeting, boards and committees, as well as town staff. Town staff have until, I want to say this, 6th to the 13th, 13th, I think. It says the 6th. 6th um, for staff and 13th for the public at large, I believe is what it is. And then. That's what we take your name. Right, and then on the 13th, I will then make sure that all of the hard copy of those gets you guys by before Monday. So, so this is the time out. We, so as you can see, we really don't uh, talk to each other outside of meetings. Um, so yeah, this timeline doesn't work because we don't meet on the 16th. That's right. I will have to get it to you without meeting and with so, you. so um, it's talking about the packet for the 16th. It's talking about self-evaluation for the town manager. There, 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 there's stuff. Right. So you're going to want to revise that? Yes. And, and basically just push the things that needed to happen to the 23rd. And I think it got screwed up because we didn't have this ninth select board meeting listed. And it says very clearly, Monday, July 16th, select board meeting, even though we confirmed last week that there isn't one. one. So That's right. um, it's when that happened that things just kind of came apart so as you indicated already staff questionnaires were already due so that's right. taken care of and then public comments are due by that's four o'clock this week on Friday and since we don't have a meeting on the 16th my question at that point is um, I can see that the bottom two bullet points here the self-evaluation for the town manager presentation and questions is gonna have, is gonna wait till the 23rd and the packet will include the self-evaluation, the form, and the goals. That's for the 23rd. So in terms of getting stuff, have we been getting much in the way of stuff other than forms from staff? And because we, back in the day, we used to get more paper letters. Hardly anybody does that anymore. I, have, I didn't check today. So, so I there, there may was, be nothing to get to there us wasn't is what much. it comes down to other than the staff items. And the staff items could be mailed to us maybe... What's the easiest way to do that? Are they did so, people do it online this year or on paper? I've not seen any online, but I'm not saying that that hasn't happened, but it may have. Um, what my plan was was to get those materials collected uh, this Friday, and then get them to you on Monday, if not before, regardless but, of whether we have but, a meeting or not. 
mean so, you can drive to our house on Monday? Like, how does that even make sense? It's, it's <laughs> not that big a town. Yeah, I would. No, I would. Because um, I don't want to delay it a week. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is we were going to get from the manager on the 13th, 13th. which is that Friday, his self-valuation. So that in combination with those would all go to you as if it were a packet, but not a packet because they're not public. Documents. So we're still good with that timeline. Still, even, even though we're not actually, so we won't have a presentation and questions obviously on the 16th because we're not correct. meeting, but you're comfortable doing your self-evaluation um, in the packet still, you're still on schedule for this week. More. He's like, sure, yeah, okay. Well, the reality is, if it's not, I mean, I don't want to mess up your weekend either any more than we normally do. But the reality is, it's not a Friday packet for Monday because, like, there isn't a meeting no. today. So I will be. But I know people them. are like coming and going in terms of vacations, and that's right. why to get them right. to us, right? right? So that we have because we are still on the plan with the forms are due back to you on the sixth. Yes, of August. Of August, okay. yes. That's still so, the just target. Just speaking of my own self-interest, because I'm going to be away from the 19th to the 24th, I appreciate that you are going to go through the effort of, of delivering them or making sure we get them or you know, sending them well, priority. Well, prior to the 23rd, because so you'll yeah, be Yeah, so, right. and, I won't, and I won't be at the meeting of the 23rd, as the right. chair knows. Right, right. So that's, that was best. why I think we kept that, but we didn't right. clean up the, the draft. Yeah. So I will... Perhaps include a revised, non, no longer draft version of that. With that might be an idea. So that yeah, we take the draft off. Take the draft off. Put of red a couple of those loose borders ends. or something. But we were also going right. to still talk about those dates in August. Did we come up with any solution on the Friday, August twenty fourth thing, or Wednesday, September fifth thing? This is the part where you say, I didn't think about it again. That's totally reasonable. It happens. Like, the, but that, that is what we discussed there's the last that. time. Is we deciding what to do. <laughs> but I think we'll. We may have to, as part of the 23rd's conversation, we may need to be more for Connie won't be here. Right, about that's that. the problem. Oh, right. So we were talking about would we meet on Friday, potentially meeting Monday the 20th, and then again on Friday, August 24th at 8 in the morning, because that was theoretically going to work for people. Otherwise, we were going to have to push it off until Wednesday the 5th, which was our next select board meeting, which would have plenty of other select board things to do. On the 24th. Which is fine, even though right. penciled in no, is an archaic term because nobody pencils right. it. Yeah, so we have that on hold. And if you say we're going to do it and I'm away, then just tell me it. it's in my calendar. Because we know for sure that Mr. Steinberg is going to be away on the 27th, and I, there would be possibly you were also going to be away, yeah, Ms. Kruger, so on the 27th. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even clear if right. we're meeting at all that day, much less doing would... the town manager evaluation. All sorts of stuff. We can do all kinds of stuff with that, yeah. The chair. We're going to do marijuana <laughs> licensing that night. <laughs> No, you have to wait for me to be absent for that. Sorry. I think, uh, I think you'll, you'll go back and figure it all out. Yeah, I will, I will sort through that and better. sort through my notes from so, last time. But. Well, that's what we said. Friday the 24th, 8 o'clock. Yeah. Because yeah. that that's would work for you. Mark. So that's instead of, at this point, Monday the 27th, in terms of town manager evaluation. We may still have a meeting if we have to right. do right. a bunch of non-marijuana licenses or something <laughs> else. Right. But we would... Not the, the, the equivalent of the Monday the 27th meeting would actually take place on Friday the 24th at right. 8 a.m. Well, otherwise we're going to be missing two people. Well, I mean, maybe in that... We, Versus we get, Wednesday the 5th. I'm saying maybe because we, we scheduled it, but we're waiting to get the final final. Right. That's why I'm saying Which maybe. is magically going to change because... No, I'm assuming... Well, because he hasn't, he hasn't taken Because he's draft the chair off. and he can decide. He hasn't taken a draft. He hasn't Press taken a draft. draft. <laughs> we draft until about the 10th of September. Uh huh. Okay. Uh -huh. But yes, I will tidy that up. More importantly, in the short term, is that as of Friday afternoon, I'll collect a bunch of things. It'll you will see cool. them hopefully on Monday. Right. And I'll photocopy them, any of the hard copy stuff, the electronic, most of any of the electronic stuff we've received already, you already have. Um, but we will. Okay. Uh, there's but, only been a couple. I don't remember getting any. The, the reason... Mistaken? No. Maybe yeah. personally. Me. The reason I'll I was... Check that. You've gotten nothing yet. Yeah. The reason I was asking about electronic for staff is I don't think those would have come to us. I think they would have gone... They may have gone directly to me. I, I have, I think, and one or two that I can okay. recall. Just know that we I don't have them. The okay. equivalent of yeah, those yeah. forms. Yeah, and so Because we've gone through different iterations of paper yeah. versus need electronic. So new timeline. 
and the 27th then being questionable altogether. States are sneaking up on me. All right. <laughs> they have a way of are there any them. other select board member reports? Actually, I want to just follow up on something that came up um, a moment ago in Ms. Brewer's report. Uh, the select board shared calendar. I, I plead guilty to the error, and it was based upon the fact that I pulled um, that from this memo and um, then it created it confusion. Um, I wonder um, if uh, we want to see if Ms. Mills would be willing to take over maintenance of the select board shared calendar, recognizing that it may segue to another elected body at some point in the future. Um, Do the select board members use it? Um, no. No, because it's not reliable, so I was <laughs> So we gave up on it. And then it'll go in. If it were reliable, twice. would you use it? Well, yeah. in two respects. One, if our meetings were just uploaded to it, because it's that same old argument about open meeting law. Open meeting law is so great, except for the fact that we don't have any of our meetings posted because, you know, we don't have the list of topics ready yet. So we have the list on the select board page, so if we could preload all those in here accurately that'd be helpful in and of itself but that's like every time we vote every six months or whatever to do that that's just a one-time deal what it was supposed to also be helping us with was things like oh you're going to give the speech at valley bike okay so that'll be slaughter and steinberg and whoever at that particular speech oh nobody can go to the habitat thing or whatever right. we can't really expect this bills so oh, that we cannot, us. and that that we have so, not effectively done. But if done she would be either. willing to just accurately, <laughs> we, <never kept> up, <laughs> we did not. Awesome. We did not exercise that part of it. That was the intent. It was originally. a theory. So then Ms. Brewer so, so will write a, to us. And so just have the board meetings on it. We either have the board meetings or not, but uh, it, it would be lovely if somebody sat down and loaded in the board meetings. But then it'd yeah. just be that's done. An easy thing to then do, it'd right. just be right. done Which because includes things like four boards. Although right. a lot of these, yeah. know all those dates. Have a whole lot of, yeah. Right, all the dates you already have. Yep. Yeah. Dates we that's, have. That's not hard to do. When dates change, go in and clean clean up the. As long as we know how to get into the calendar. <laughs> if not, I can. My dad been stuck in Brianna. Right. And then I think the other thing that is often there is. Um, other events were invited to, so like the Valley Bike Share right. is often listed there. Those are those are fairly easy to add. Things that we get invited to as a, right. as a whole, like the UMass events go in there. Right, and, you know, right. The opening day, whatever the okay. breakfast, that kind of stuff, because mm -hmm. it helps remind us that we forgot to put it in our right. calendar. Right. Okay. So I think really we're asking Mr. Bachman to put them in the calendar. That's <laughs> what it comes down Take to, because he knows what kind of things we go to. Right. Yeah. But it's yeah, it would be helpful for Ms. Mills to see. Be able to track that yeah. as well just for educational right. part yeah because right. it should pull everything together all right is there any other member reports hearing none i would take a motion to adjourn unless there's just there's one other thing and that is <laughs> I'll yes, just this will be real quick and that is um i would um we've gone through a long period of time without rotating the vice chair because ms brewer's been kind enough to oh mr wall in. did it for this long meeting he did. Yeah. Did he? he did it he came back yep. he, he came it. back just long yeah. enough to do Left again. okay i take that back then i was just inquiring and i moved to adjourn <laughs> is there a second <laughs> all right thank you for looking out for me but yes he came <laughs> oh. back just to do that basically. all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. and we're adjourned at ten twenty-four.